Sir, you can start now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, myself, Dr. Mahesh, Poregolo, Secretary of uh, Bangalore Obi Society. I welcome you all for uh, today's uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, to start with, I would uh, like to invite uh, our event coordinator of today, Dr. Manjana Swami, who will be coordinating the event today for us. And uh, he is a medical director at Baby Science IVF Clinics Private Limited and is consultant laparoscopic and fertility specialist for more than 15 years and a chairperson for uh, Karnataka chapter of ISA 21 to 23. And he has been EC member of BSOG and member of all other academic bodies. And uh, he has been invited for a lot of lecturers and he uh, has a teaching experience as assistant professor earlier and a fellowship trainer. And he has special interest in regenerative medicine, infertility, FET and uh, mild evolution stimulation protocols. Welcome Dr. Manjanath and please uh, take over the event coordination for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahesh. Now, uh, keeping uh, the BSOG is coming every week, almost every week, maybe sometimes twice a week. We are coming with beautiful programs. Thanks to our president and secretary, Dr. Padmi, Padmini Prasad and Dr. Mahesh. And with keeping our theme, the women's wellness and illness speak the unspoken, we have come up, come up with a beautiful program, uh, the Vagina River, the Secret Passage. I was wondering, uh, uh, in fact, uh, what is this? It's may, maybe a, such a small topic, but after going through the program list, I was like, wow, there are so many things to learn. I think I, uh, Madam would have kept this as a physical meeting, maybe more attendance would have been there, but still we have a good number of attendance. Now, I request Dr. Mahesh Koregal uh, to give a, a short speech on, uh, welcome and a short speech on how uh, what are the things we will cover in this uh, webinar. Dr. Mahesh, uh, can we have Dr. Mahesh CV? The Dr. Mahesh Koragal, one, one of the dynamic uh, secretary of the BSOG and he's a consultant uh, in uh, at Nova Fertility uh, Bangalore and he's been associated with various uh, uh, societies uh, apart from this uh, BSOG. He's a FOXI Endo Committee member. Uh, member of Foxy, ISAR, KISAR, IFS, ICOG, and uh, he's a chair, uh, chairperson reproductive endocrinology committee, Kasova 2021 to 22. And he has a rich a teaching experience. He has trained many fellowship candidates. He has done many, uh, he, has, he has been uh, uh, assistant professor in JJ, JNMC Bangalore and in uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Medical College too. And he has many uh, academic excellence, like he has many journals and publications. Mahesh, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Manjanath. And uh, today it's a very eventful and a very interesting topic, Vajana, the river, the sacred uh, passage. And uh, for this uh, coordination of event, I welcome Dr. Manjanath and Dr. Jyoti GS. And uh, today's uh, uh, the speakers are really who have worked in this field and who really know the in-depth knowledge of this field. And this program of uh, the different uh, pelvic organs, the theme-based organs has been brainchild of uh, our own president, Dr. Padmin Prasad, and I welcome her and I thank her for uh, having such a wonderful series of uh, webinars who have been really highly attended, highly appreciated, and really have been uh, doing well. And uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Jyoti, who is a professor department of anatomy for her lecture on vagina 3D anatomy and histology. Dr. Uma Devi on uh, lecture on vaginal microbiota and uh, Dr. Venkat Ramana for uh, STD, RTI of Esther and current years. Dr. Bafna sir for uh, VIN and vaginal carcinoma. Dr. Shobha Gudi for vaginal contraception. Dr. Padmi Pasad who will speak on vaginal bling, touch me not. Dr. Ragni Agarwal for botox therapy. And Dr. Pravin Matre sir for neo vagina. And Dr. Mayesh, the plastic surgeon for hymenoplasty and hymenal surgeries. And Dr. Sunita. I also welcome today's chairpersons, Dr. Padmaja, Dr. Suranda Kulkarni, and uh, Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Narayan Swami, Dr. Sheila Mane, Dr. Anantheshwar for chairing today's session. I welcome all the delegates who have been uh, here with the interest to learn on a bright Sunday morning. I welcome you all delegates. With this, I would like to start introduction of what actually, how the holy, uh, the books or the 
how the past has treated the vajana as one of the holiest places uh, to start with i would uh, like to share my screen and i'll start my presentation okay can you see my screen yeah so yoni is a sanskrit word with various meanings such as womb vajana that is place of birth source origin spring abode home layer nest family race stock or caste it is etymologically derived from the verbal root you that is join unite fasten or harness from which is derived the english yoke knee is added to the root to form a noun with active meaning thus uni is what joins or unites the word yoga derived from the same root means union connection the two words uni and yoga are thus similar to the word religion from the latin religio binding fastening reuniting or relinking so uni mudra which is used in yoga practice is a principle in meditation used to reduce the distraction during beginning of yoga practice in the thai language the medical the medial kanthas the sharp corner of the eye close to nose effort was yoni tha where the tha means the eye archaeological remains from the sites at harappa and mohenjodaro abound in mother goddess figurines large stone yonis and lingams and a variety of seals who and one of the most intriguing of these seals bears the figure of a man in a cross legged posture typical of a yogic discipline in mohenjodaro era Caves dating from about twenty thousand to eleven thousand before Christ BCE, yoni symbols have been found in profusion in these caves. Many of them identical to some of the Indian representations of the yoni. The most often found Paleolithic yoni symbol is the same as tantric symbol, namely a downward pointing triangle. The most striking such representation, the one found at France, dating from about thirteen thousand to eleven thousand BC. a colossal group of three female torsos with exaggerated yonis all represented as cleft downwards pointing triangles are etched in the living rock wall cave walls are clefts and clefts in the rock walls are not only the yonic associations one encounters cross culturally mountains themselves have been associated with the yoni which is a latin term mons veneris meaning yonic triangle at its sense it literally means mountain of the venus underlying the symbolic associations between the earth its caves furrows and waters and the vulva is the notion of the transformative powers of the female sexuality yoni appears in the rigveda and other vedic literature in the sense of feminine life creating regenerative and reproductive organs as well as in the sense of source origin fountain place of birth womb nest abode fire pit of incubation other contextual meaning of the term include race caste family fertility symbol grain or seed it is spiritual metaphor and icon in hinduism for the origin and the feminine regenerative powers in the nature of the existence the reverence for yoni is probably pre vedic figurines recovered from zof valley and dated to the 4th millennium bc shows pronounced dress and yoni and these may have been fertility symbols used in the prehistoric times that ultimately evolved into later spiritual symbols according to david lemming the yoni worship tradition dates to the pre vedic period over 4000 bc to 1000 bc period yoni has served as a divine symbol from the ancient times and it may well be the oldest spiritual icon not only in india but across many ancient cultures some in the orthodox western culture states that indologist laura amazon have treated the feminine sexual organs and sexuality in general as a taboo subject but in indic religions and other ancient cultures yoni has long been accepted and profound cosmological and philosophical truth of the feminine potential and power one mysteriously interconnected with the natural periodic cycles of the moon earth and existence The term yoni and its derivatives appear in the ancient medicine and surgery related Sanskrit texts such as Sushruta Samhita, Charaka Samhita. In this context, yoni broadly refers to the female sexual and procreative organs. According to Indologists Rahul Das and Garrett uh, Mulkerbelt, known for their translations and reviews of the ancient Sanskrit medical and other literatures, 
Yoni usually denotes a vajana or vulva. In the technical sense, it also includes the uterus along with these. Moreover, yoni can at times mean simply womb uterus too, though it does so relatively seldom. According to Amit Rupara et al., yogi roga, yoni roga means gynecological disorders and yoni vorti means vaginal suppository. It dedicates to the 30th chapter of Chikitsa Sthana or Venu Vyapat or Gynecological Disorders. The Yoni is one of the sacred icons of the Hindu sectism tradition with the historic arts and temples dedicated to it. And it is one of the artworks related to Yoni include Lajja Gauri found in many parts of India and the Kamakya temple in the Assam. And across India, many temples have Lajja Gauri is found as worshipped also. And uh, Kamakya Temple is one of the oldest Shakta P Shakti Pita in the South Asia for sacred pilgrim site in the Shaktism tradition. And it features a uni shaped natural rock with a fissure and a natural water spring flowing through it. The association of menstruation with sacredness is reinforced in tantric practice such as yoni puja, worship of the female yoni, wherein ritual worship is carried, but not only of a woman, but also of her yoni or vagina, which is perceived to be a symbol of the cosmic yoni form from which the entire universe has emerged. Menstrual blood is in fact considered as pure and sacred and plays a very important role in these tantric rituals. Thank you for your time. With this introduction, I welcome all of you again for this wonderful session. We will throw a lot of light on the different aspects and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. It was a wonderful introduction to the, uh, today's session, actually. So um, uh, now I'll request uh, for our first session, I, I'd like to introduce two main chairperson, Dr. Padmaja. I can have uh, uh, Dr. Mer Mer Madam's uh, CV. Dr. Padmaja is an obstetric and gynecologist, uh, postgraduate teacher and examiner, and member BSOG CME committee and secretary for ANBA Karnataka. Uh, I'd and like to introduce the second uh, chairperson, Dr. Sunanda Kulkarni, who is our own, uh, my own uh, HOD and uh, professor. Uh, I learned a lot of uh, things from her. Thank you so much, madam. And she is uh, a nice person, and uh, and she. I mean, there is no words to describe her uh, personality. Thank you so much for accepting and being here, madam. And uh, to read about her CV, she is, she was a HOD from Bangalore Medical College, and also from Adi Sinchiringari Medical College. At present, working as a DNB coordinator at Chinmaya Mission Hospital, Bangalore. Performed more than twenty thousand laparoscopic tubal ligation. Examiner for UG and PG. Edited and co authored four books, published many papers, international and national. Trainer for MTP and laparoscopic surgery and PPTCT, published 22 books and more than 500 articles in Canada. And awarded as Doctor's Day uh, for Doctor's Day Award, Gurur Award, Kannada Ratna Award, Shankara Prashasti, uh, Prashasti Award, Sri Ratna Prashasti, Kempe Goda Prashasti. So many awards has been awarded to. Madam, thank you so much for being here, madam. And like to uh, um, ask, request both the chairperson to proceed with first two topics. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Manjunath, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, Dr. Sunanda Kulakarni, madam. It's a pleasure always to be with you. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Padmini Prasad for giving us this opportunity and having a session on this wonderful. Uh, when you're having this wonderful session, because like uh, Dr. Mahesh said, I mean, vagina is something which has not got its importance. And though it is like we deal with it every day, somehow it has not uh, got its uh, due recognition. I think it's a very wonderful seminar that you have organized. And uh, thank you for that. And uh, Madam, you want to say something, Dr. Sunanda? Yeah, I wanted to just tell about the Yoni only. See, this uh, Yoni, uh, what I have read is it is more than, uh, it is uh, mentioned more than 6,000 years back, uh, uh, pre-Vedic period. And it was, Yoni was in the four form. The first form is like a uh, pot. And the, so that is Atma. So after death, again, it, the Atma will come back. So that is rebirth. 
uh, so it is uh, that's why it is called as goddess of infertility fertility and uh, it is also the 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 uh, 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 the womb is it is called, outside it is called as a yoni and that is the first stage second stage where they were keeping one pot and two strands like that on either side and in the third stage she is called as lajja gauri in lajja gauri she will not show her face you you can see her the lotus in in the lotus in the in the place of the head and all other body and the the she will show her yoni sometimes she may stretch it and show or sometimes she may show yoni and the fourth stage is you can see her face so i have seen this uh, lajja gauri in uh, lakshmeshwar now that is a recent but very recent one it was in the well and it, and uh, near tadpatri on the way to mantralaya and in lakundi and uh, uh, this one aihole near aihole and uh, it was seen in the chalukya and uh, hoysala dynasty in both the dynasty and uh, in kamakya temple there is a um, the first they put the kumkum to the uh, lajja gauri and then the four water that's why it looks like menstruation which already dr mahesh has shown it and uh, uh, this is about the lajja gauri and the lajja gauri is also seen in the patient it was seen one one uh, gauri uh, uh, this one is not statue that is a uh, sculpture was seen in uh, near peshawar also so afghanistan border peshawar and in south india there are plenty of places even in madhya pradesh i have seen so that is about the yoni and uh, for that our our you know, first speaker is dr jyoti who is going to tell about the anatomy of the uh, vagina would you introduce or should i introduce madam you need to introduce I, yeah i think they can have the slide yeah, yeah. okay dr jyoti she is assistant professor since 9 years in uh, msrmc medical uh, ramaya medical college published 16 research articles in various national and international journals received best paper presentation award twice during karnataka state anatomy conference held in jss medical college and bangalore medical college and guided four students to undertake short research project active member of voluntary body donation at ramaya medical college delivered guest lectures on voluntary body donation in various programs she is going to speak about the yoni or the vagina vagina is the passage for the menstruation for the coitus and for the baby and it is the uh, the uh, 12 cm the uh, distance which travels baby travels first time where there is a question of life and death she is going to describe about the yoni anatomy uh, good morning thank you every, uh, madam for uh, your introduction uh, i'll start with my presentation now um, The topic for today is, is 3D anatomy of the vagina. I am Dr. Jyoti Kesi, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy from uh, Ms. Ramaya Medical College. Uh, Madam, I hope uh, you all can hear me, ma'am. Yes. 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 Yes.
to the lateral pelvic wall and this causes the collapsing or where the anterior and the posterior vagina wall approximates to each other and it gives the lumen as a head shaped or a transverse slit when we see the interior of the vagina interior of the vagina presents transverse folds and they are called as rugis and these transverse folds are more prominent in nulliparous women where it helps in stretching and dilatation of the vagina during coitus and parturition and these goes on obliterating in a uh, post menopausal women and when we see the anterior vaginal wall presents a number of sulci which might bear an importance during surgery and the three important sulcus which are present on the anterior vaginal wall the first one is the submeatal sulcus which is present uh, just below the meatus just uh, above the meatus and 35 mm below the submeatal sulcus is an anterior sulcus that is a Uh, important sulcus transverse vaginal sulcus which corresponds or which is in between the urethral opening and the bladder opening and the third sulcus which is present just in front or below it is the your bladder sulcus this is the these are the three important sulcus which bears very important the one is the submeatal sulcus the transverse vaginal sulcus and the bladder sulcus so coming to the fornis of vagina since uh the uterus protrudes into the vaginal wall the gutter shaped or a recess which is present between the cervix and the vaginal wall forms the fornix so there are two lateral fornix which you see in this picture the two lateral fornix between the cervix and the vaginal wall and there is an anterior fornix between the anterior vaginal wall and the anterior surface of the uh, cervix and there is a posterior fornix between the posterior part of the cervix and the posterior vaginal wall so since the posterior vaginal wall is attached at a higher level than the anterior wall the posterior fornix is more roomy and deeper compared to the anterior fornix so this picture shows the attachment of the posterior vagina wall at an higher level than the anterior fornix and this gives the posterior fornix more deeper uh, place where the number of uh, important surgery can be done through these where they can access into the peritoneal cavity that is the pouch of douglas which i'm going to tell in the next it's so coming to the relationship of the vagina anteriorly the vagina is related to the bladder so in the lower one third the vagina is related to the urethra and the para urethral glands or skene's tubules and the urethra and the vagina is separated by urethro vaginal fascia which are which form a fused structure and it is uh, slightly difficult to separate the urethro vaginal fascia and it can be only separated by a sharp dissection in the upper part the vagina is separated from the base of the bladder and there is a vesico vaginal fascia which is uh, compared to the uh, urethro vaginal space it is slightly loose there is a loose areola tissue and it can be easily separated by a uh, blunt dissection and there is a considerable vascular and lymphatic intercommunication between the vesical vessels and the vaginal vessels which takes place in this space and which bears importance during the surgery for malignant diseases so this anterior relation it is entirely non peritoneal and related to urethra in the lower part and bladder in the upper part so posteriorly the vagina is related to the posterior uh, rectum of the uh, ampulla of the rectum and then in the lower part it is the anal canal which is separated by the perineal body so when we see the just behind the posterior fornix of vagina there is a a wide recto pouch which is called as recto uterine pouch of douglas okay this recto uterine pouch of douglas is formed by the peritoneal reflection on from the posterior aspect of the uterus the posterior fornix of the vagina upper part of the posterior vaginal wall and it gets reflected onto the upper one third of the rectum so this pouch is called as recto uterine pouch of douglas which is the most dependent part in the standing and the supine position and any fluid can get collected easily in this space and it can be accessed or the 
the fluid can be aspirated for the diagnostic or the therapeutic purpose uh, by passing a needle in the posterior fornix. It's shown in this picture by posterior fornix. And then uh, we can aspirate the fluid. And this uh, procedure is called as caldocentesis. And the posterior vagina, and there it, you, we can also open this uh, place and then go into or access to an a, any abscess which is located in this position and which is called as colpotomy. So, as I told the posteriorly, it is related to the, in the lower one third, it is really, it is entirely non-peritoneal and it is related to perineal body and separated by the anal canal. And then it is related to the rectum, ampulla of the rectum and separated by recto vaginal fascia of denonvilia. Okay. So, in the middle one third, it is separated by ampulla of the rectum by recto vaginal fascia of denonvilia. Upper one third, it is separated by the coils of uh, sigmoid colon, coils of small intestine and the sigmoid colon by the recto uterine pouch of Douglas. Laterally, the vagina is connected to the lateral pelvic walls by important structure which forms the parametrium in the upper part and paracolpers in the lower part. So this parametrium and paracolpers are the pelvic cellular uh, structures or pelvic cellular tissue which connects the vagina to the lateral pelvic wall. So from above downwards, we see the parametrium which contains the ureter, the uterine vessels and the mechanrods ligament. Okay, And the, in the lower part, it is the levator ani muscle which is covered by the pelvic fascia and uh, just below the levator ani, we have superficial muscles of the perineum, which includes bulbospongiosis, ischiocavernosis, superficial transverse perineal muscle. And then still in the lower part, we have the cavernous tissue of the vestibule, which is covered by this bulbospongiosis muscle. So from above downwards, the lateral aspect of the vagina is related to the parametrial tissue containing ureter and the uterine artery, the levator ani muscle, superficial muscles of the perineum and the cavernous tissue of the vestibule. So which forms a bulb of the vestibule, which is covered by bulbospongiosis muscle. So in the lower part, lateral on either side of the vagina, there is the bulb of the vestibule, which is an erectile uh, tissue, which extends from the clitoris and goes backwards, which is covered by bulbospongiosis muscle, okay, which is a part of the uh, superficial perineal pouch. Okay, and uh, this muscle is uh, known to cause constriction of the vagina, and then there is a greater vestibular gland just behind these bulb of vestibule. These greater vestibular glands are also called as Bartholin's gland, which amounts for a considerable, which uh, secretes a mucus secretion, uh, which pours into the vagina. So, coming to the important part that is the supports of vagina. So as we all know, levator ani, the muscle of the pelvic diaphragm is the major support for the uh, female reproductive system or the all the pelvic organs. However, D. Lance has uh, described the three levels of vaginal support. The first level is called as level one, which is called as upper vaginal support, mainly supports the apex of the vagina and uh, the lower part of the cervix. The level two is the mid vaginal support, which anchors the vagina to the lateral pelvic wall. And the level three is the lower vaginal support, which mainly uh, supports the lower part of the vagina, like urogenital diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm. I'll go one by one. So we'll see the first level or the level one support according to D. Lance. That is the paracolpium. Paracolpium or paracolpose is the pelvic cellular tissue which is present on either side of the vagina and which connects the vaginal wall, lateral vaginal wall to the pelvic, uh, lateral pelvic wall. So the level one mainly includes the cardinal uterosacral ligament complex, which suspends the apex of the vagina from above and prevents the downward displacement of the vagina in case of increased intra-abdominal pressure. So we'll go with the uh, first level. So it is the cardinal ligament or transverse cervical ligament or McEnroth's ligament. 
it's a condensation of the endopelvic tissue the endopelvic tissue is nothing but the covering of the outermost covering of the connective tissue covering of the pelvic organs is called as endopelvic tissue which connects these organs to the lateral pelvic wall so and um, around the laterally these endopelvic fascia will uh, condense to form a ligamentous structures okay which anchors the vagina to the lateral pelvic wall so there is the important ligament called as cardinal ligament or transverse cervical ligament or mckendroth's ligament which anchors or which uh, attaches the cervico vaginal junction to the white line of the or white tendinous line which i'm going to tell in the next slides so this is a white tendinous line and these are the triangular ligament which connects the cervico vaginal junction to the lateral pelvic wall or fascia covering the obturator internus muscle and these tendon or these ligaments also conduits or it acts as a passage for the uterine vessel certain lymphatics and nerves will pass through this the second important uh, uh, ligament is the uterosacral ligament the uterosacral ligament as the name suggests which which attaches the uterus at uh, mainly at the cervical uh, vaginal junction and goes backwards see this uterosacral ligament goes backwards on either side of the rectum and is attached to the Uh, anterior aspect of the sacrum so these both the, the cardinal ligament and uterosacral ligament suspends the vagina from the uh, upper part so it it holds the apical part of the vagina and keeps the vagina in the midline uh, position so so this is the uterosacral ligament and the cardinal ligament when it is excessively stretched or weakened may lead to prolapse of the uterus uh the next uh, level is the level 2 uh, paracolpium which attaches the vagina laterally via arcus tendinous fascia pelvis and arcus tendinous levator ani and also through pubo cervical fascia and the recto vaginal fascia these are the structures which connects the lateral part of the vagina in the middle uh, portion which connects the middle part of the vagina to the lateral pelvic wall so what is this arcus tendinous fascia pelvis so arcus tendinous fascia pelvis is also called as facial white line facial white line which is a thickening of the parietal fascia of the levator ani which is a thickening of the parietal fascia of the levator ani levator ani is a major muscle which forms the pelvic diaphragm so it this is the arcus tendinous fascia pelvis which extends from the ischial spine and goes backwards to the back of the symphysis pubis so this fascia the the fascia which covers the levator ani or the pelvic fascia which covers the levator ani is thickened along this line and this is called as arcus tendinous fascia pelvis which is in turn attached to the arcus tendinous levator ani this is arcus tendinous levator ani so detachment of this arcus tendinous fascia pelvis from the lateral pelvic wall may lead to the para vaginal uh, defect so we we'll come to the arcus tendinous levator ani it's a thickening of the parietal fascia covering the obturator internus muscle this is the obturator internus muscle so the lower part of the obturator fascia the fascia covering the obturator internus muscle is thickened and extends from the pubic arch anteriorly to the ischial spine posteriorly and this forms the arcus tendinous levator ani where most of the muscles or mainly the levator ani muscle takes origin from this arcus tendinous levator ani so and also gives attachment to pubo cervical uh, fascia in front and recto vaginal fascia behind so pubo cervical fascia these are the fascias which attaches the uh, cervix upper and the upper part of the vagina uh, and the vaginal walls to the lateral pelvic wall so it, they arise this is the pubo cervical fascia this is the pubo cervical fascia which extends from the back of the pubic bone and from the arcus tendinous fascia laterally and inserted into the supra vaginal cervix upper part of the vagina and blends with the peri cervical ring of the endopelvic fascia so endopelvic fascia covering the cervix is thickened all around 
and that forms a peri cervical fascia from the peri cervical fascia the cardinal ligament the utero-sacral ligament all these ligaments and the uh, pubo cervical fascia or the pubo cervical ligaments arises and this forms a peri cervical ring which is an important structure to hold the cervix in the midline position next is a recto vaginal fascia it's a fascia of denovilla it is an extension of the endopelvic fascia as i already told endopelvic fascia is a connective tissue covering of these pelvic organs which are thickened uh, or condensed to form a ligaments which anchors or connects these pelvic organs to the lateral pelvic wall this recto vaginal fascia extends uh, between the posterior vaginal wall and anterior wall of the rectum and this fuses below to the perineal body and laterally it is attached to arcus tendinus fascia and then the to the mckendroitz ligament posteriorly it is attached to the uterosacral ligament so if we see this picture you can see this is the recto vaginal fascia which is present between the vagina and the rectum and then it is attaches laterally to the arcus tendinus fascia this fascia is a pubo cervical uh, fascia and then the ligament which extends anteriorly and connects to the pubis this is a pubo cervical ligament the third level of support is where the distal vaginal attachment mainly includes the urogenital diaphragm which supports the vagina from below the perineal body the pelvic diaphragm and the levator plate these forms a major support for the lower part of the vagina so urogenital diaphragm is also called as triangular ligament it's a triangular musculofacial diaphragm this uh, part where this is the vaginal uh, vagina this is the levator ani muscle this is the obturator internus muscle this is the urogenital diaphragm so this is the levator ani which forms a pelvic diaphragm which separates the pelvic cavity from the perineal cavity so urogenital urogenital diaphragm uro is mainly made up of superior fascia and the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm the inferior fascia is also called as perineal membrane and this urogenital diaphragm mainly consists of two important muscle the sphincter urethrae muscle this is the sphincter urethrae which is surrounding the external urethral sphincter it's a sphincter urethrae which mainly is responsible for the voluntary control of the micturition and the deep uh, transverse perineal muscles are present between the two layers of the urogenital diaphragm so the next important structure which supports the lower part of the vagina posteriorly is the perineal body or central uh, point or central tendon of the perineum it is also called as gynecological perineum this is a pyramidal shaped fibromuscular body it's a pyramidal shaped fibromuscular body because number of fibrous tissue and the muscles are attached to it which is present between the vaginal opening and the anal opening inferiorly this gives attachment to number of pelvic floor muscles and the perineal muscles the muscles which are attached to the perineal body includes the superficial transverse perineal muscle which is a muscle of the superficial perineal pouch the bulbospongiosus mother the right and the left bulbospongiosus the right and left superficial transverse perineal muscle the levator ani the pubo vaginalis part of the levator ani which i am going to tell in the next slide and the sphincter ani externus muscle these are the muscle which covers or which is attached to the perineal body which supports the posterior vaginal wall the recto vaginal fascia is attached to the perineal body inferiorly so any disruption or uh, the of attachment of the recto vaginal fascia to the perineal body will uh, the post will causes loss of support to the posterior vaginal wall so coming to the pelvic diaphragm it is a a gutter shaped a structure which forms a pelvic uh, pelvic uh, diaphragm which separates the perine pelvic cavity above and the perineum below it is mainly made by levator ani muscle and the coccygeus muscle or ischio coccygeus levator ani is again having two components the pubo coccygeus muscle which is present um, inferior anteriorly 
and the iliococcygeus muscle. The pubococcygeus is again, I'm showing, this is the pubococcygeus muscle, which is attached from the posterior surface of the pubis, runs on either side of the uh, urethra, vagina, and the rectum, and it is attached in the midline to a raphe. This is called as uh, fibrous raphe, and this also forms a levator plate. This the two pubococcygeus muscle, which is attached in the midline to a tendon or a fibrous raphe, and this is called as median uh, fibrous raphe. Okay, this is uh, of the levator ani muscle, which forms a levator plate, and this pubococcygeus. Just anterior to the pubococcygeus, there is a puborectalis muscle, puborectalis muscle, which forms a sling around the rectum, which is mainly responsible uh, for the forward pull of the uh, rectum to maintain the anorectal uh, flexure. This is the main responsible for maintaining the anorectal flexure. And in turn, the rectum also supports the posterior vaginal wall, which is present in front of it. The next inferior muscle, which is present below the puborectalis, is the pubovaginalis muscle. Pubovaginalis also takes origin from the posterior surface of the pubis and then uh, gets attached between the vagina and the rectum to the perineal body. So this is a pubovaginalis muscle, then forms a puborectal sling, and then posteriorly there is a pubococcygeus muscle. The next uh, posterior muscle is the iliococcygeus, which is a triangular muscle, which takes no, no. origin... Okay. Yes, ma'am? I think uh, only two minutes are remaining. Yes, ma'am. I'll go, ma'am. The pubo, I, uh, this arises from the white li tendinous line, and then this is the ischiococcygeus muscle. So, histology part: the vagina is mainly uh, uh, has got the mucosal layer, which is the stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. It can form keratin when case of prolonged prolapse when it is exposed to the uh, air. And then there is a thick muscular layer which has got um, uh, the muscles which are arranged in an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer. The adventitial layer mainly forms the uh, endocervical uh, fascia. And as such, the vagina does not produce any uh, secretion because there are no glands and all the secretions in the uh, vagina is mainly by the cervix or from the Bartholin's glands or from the uh, uterus. And whatever uh, the vaginal epithelium mainly contains glycogen, and this is acted upon by the Dodderlin's bacilli, which is a normal inhabitant which is present in the vagina and leads to the formation of lactic acid. So the pH of the vagina is about 3.5 to 4.5, which uh, this acidic pH is responsible for the uh, normal healthy uh, vagina, which prevents the pyogenic organism. And this also explains why these infections are more common in puberty and after menopause where there is uh, no uh, conversion, uh, where the pH is alkaline. So this uh, normal epithelium is changed in case of vaginal adenosis, where there is the retention or persistence of the Mullerian epithelium. That is the cervical, usually cervix is lined by the columnar epithelium. And sometimes this cervical epithelium persists in the vagina even after the birth. And this is called as vaginal adenosis, which is commonly seen in uh, the offsprings which are exposed to diethyl silvesterol. The vaginal adenosis uh, can easily convert or most of the time it can get converted into adenocarcinoma. Uh, ma'am, I would like to put a video, if you don't mind, ma'am, and finish off in five minutes. Five minutes, sir. Huh? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> because I just started a little late, ma'am. Okay. It was supposed to start at 10, 10. It started a little late, ma'am. Okay. If With your permission, uh, I can continue with the video, ma'am. And summarize with the video. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. A vagina is a fibromuscular tube, which is roughly 8 to 10 centimeters in length. It has got anterior vaginal wall and the posterior vaginal wall. If you see in this picture, the posterior vaginal wall is attached at a higher level than the anterior vaginal wall. So the vagina opens at the vulvar vestibule. Yes, I'm having the video. Is it the video? Yes, ma'am. It's the video, but I am talking, ma'am. The video is going. It's no, not coming. Not seeing the video, ma'am. It's not coming. One second, sir. One second, sir. Mm. 
you have to stop share and share again. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll do that, ma'am. Uh. Gautam, can you see the video, ma'am? Not no. Ma'am, can you see the video, ma'am? No, no, I'm not seeing. Video, yes, share. We can see your desktop. Um, okay, desktop, this is the video. Ma'am, I think it is shared, ma'am. No. no. Uh, not yet seen. You click on that video. Nando. Okay, you can summarize otherwise. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Because it takes time. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Can you see, ma'am? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now we can see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, vagina, it is a 8 to 10 centimeters fibromuscular tube which extends from the vulvar vestibule below and to the cervix or the vagina upper. This is the anterior vaginal wall. So it extends from the vulva and to the cervix. This is the external genitalia, the vaginal orifice, which is covered by an incompletely, incomplete mucus fold called as hymen. So the upper part of the vagina is called as vaginal vault. And the cervix, which protrudes into the vagina, and we can see the recess around it, the anterior fornix, the posterior fornix, lateral fornix, and two lateral fornix. So anterior and posterior vaginal walls are closely opposed, diverging at the vaginal vault and the furnaces. So this upper part is called as vaginal vault. So the relationship of the vagina anteriorly, it is the urethra in the lower part and the bladder in the upper part. Posteriorly, vagina is related to the upper part pouch of Douglas, the rectum of the ampulla and the perineal body in the lower part. So on either side, the vagina is related to the levator ani, the pelvic fascia or the paracolpos and the uterine artery and the ureters. During sexual intercourse and sexual arouse, arousal, the vagina is expanded in both length and the width. And the upper two thirds of the vagina expands and lengthens, which pushes the uterus into the, into the greater pelvis. This is the external uh, orifice. I'll just move it. This is the vaginal epithelium. Vagina does not heavy, have any glands and the vaginal secretion mainly comes from the uterus, cervix and of the Bartholin's glands. This is a Bartholin gland which opens into the uh, lumen of the vagina. So histology of the vagina, it has got mainly the advent. This is the adventitial part, the mucosa and the muscularis layer. So this is the mucosa, it is the stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium and has got a thick vascular lamina propria and the muscle layer. Five minutes over. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. Uh, I'll just finish off within, in the PPT only. <laughs> ma'am, can you see the PPT, ma'am? No, so, we are still seeing the video. Yes. Sorry. Complete that the nerves and blood supply. That's yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am.
Uh, vagina is mainly supplied by the vaginal artery, branches of uterine artery and internal pudendal artery. Venous drainage, uh, all the pelvic organs have got its own venous plexus surrounding the vagina, uterus and the rectum and they all drain into the internal iliac veins. Upper third of the vagina mainly drains into the external and internal iliac nodes and the middle third drains into the internal iliac nodes and the lower third to the superficial inguinal nodes. The vagina is mainly developed from the mullerian ducts and the urogenital sinus of the endoderm. And the, uh, the how much time we are going to take? Finish, ma'am. Finish, ma'am. So the anomalies of vagina is imperforate hymen because of problem with the uh, uh, mullerian eminence, vaginal agenesis where there is the canalization of the sinovaginal bulb is not there, the rectovaginal fistula where the mullerian eminence instead of opening into the urogenital uh, sinus anteriorly, it opens into the ectodermal proctodium behind. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jyoti. Thank you, ma'am. Video was uh, very, very nice with all colored pictures. It was uh, very good. Video was more impressive with the 3D effect. Actually, so, I had put uh, still more videos of pelvic diaphragm and urogenital diaphragm, but because of the time constraint, I could not put, ma'am. I know. And so, so we, well, anatomy, you told in detail the, about the anatomy of the vagina, which we had forgotten. At least I had forgotten. Yes. And thank you very much for, for that. And uh, only one thing I wanted to add is yes, vagina is devoid of hair, yes, glands, and crypts. That is a, a practical application. Of this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Jyoti. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank That's you for giving me opportunity, ma'am. Thank you so much. And if there are any questions. Madam, Ma we'll take the question after the next, uh, yeah. the next talk. Maybe people can put it in the chat box and we can take the questions. Yeah. Sir. At the end of each session. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. It was a good revision for all of us. And actually, vaginal cytology, earlier we used to use, but nowadays it's again coming in the postmenopausal women in a big way. Yes, so I think it's a good to revise about the vagina. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uma Devi. She is a very, very senior member of BSOG. She is a treasurer of BSOG currently. And uh, she is almost like an encyclopedia, very knowledgeable and very well-read. And uh, she was earlier uh, uh, HOD at Ramaya Medical College. Now she's the HOD at Santosh Hospital. She's a DNB teacher. And uh, she's an undergraduate teacher, postgraduate teacher with a lot of experience. And in fact, uh, many of us look forward to her talks because she's very, very knowledgeable. Welcome, uh, Dr. Uma Devi. And um, Madam is going to talk about uh, uh, vaginal microbia and uh, vaginitis and disordered equilibrium. Welcome, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Padbaja, for the kind words. So next, I'll be going on to my lecture. Can, can I share slides? I'd like to share the slide. Can you permit? Yes, you can share. Yeah, one minute. Because not finding the. Okay, share screen. Are you seeing that? Yes, yes. It hasn't come yet. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Has the screen come? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Slideshow, you go to the slideshow. Yeah. Yes, we can see that yeah. wonderful talk. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. yes ma'am. Very good morning to all of you on this Sunday morning. And after that wonderful talk by um, the anatomist, I'll be going to the next talk on the vagina. The vagina is so innocuous looking. It appears like a passage, but if there is something wrong with the vagina, the infection, it can be so hardest uh, to the patient and also her whole life becomes miserable. This is based on the experience which again across so many years, after coming across so many women coming again and again, they may be relieved within one month, but after six months, they come back. So the recurrent vaginitis is a perennial problem and we have to go step by step. 
but unfortunately we are not able to go step by step in the evaluation of the vaginal infection because our population is so huge and it is always a syndromic approach of management of all vaginal infections ulcers has become the norm today and as a result of this we may be facing with lot of microbial resistance so today's talk i'll be talking to you about the vaginal microbiome and the disordered equilibrium in vagina it is see we all know that um, vagina is a fibromuscular organ about 8 to 9 cm it can be stretched up to 12 cm so we have to know how the vagina being an open passage prevents infections from entering and affecting the vagina and also prevents the infection from ascending up because it is exposed to so many functions like procreation and also delivery so and sexually transmitted infections all these things can occur during the vaginal uh, lifetime or during the vaginal functions so here today i'll be talking on the vaginal microbiome and which will help in the understanding the pathophysiology and prevention of vaginal infections what is disordered equilibrium and antibiosis or dysbiosis and how that would invite colonizations of organisms causing vaginitis also i'll be talking a little bit about the cause of recurrent vulvar vaginitis and adopt an evidence based approach to management what are biofilms what is antibiotic resistance and is there really a role of probiotics in the management of recurrent and resistant vulvar vaginitis we'll have a look into that today and also there is a role of probiotics in fertility treatment so all these the probiotics the biofilms recurrent vulvar vaginitis all these things will be the talk of my talk today so there are no disclosures so the natural defenses of the female genital tract against infection is by the production of the synthesis of protective mucus and also the acidic ph we all know that the mature squamous epithelium of the vagina are contains glycogen so when the shed epithelial cells the glycogen is also uh, uh, converted into by the dodelin's bacillus into lactic acid and acetic acid and the acidic acidic ph 3.5 to 4.5 is very important to prevent infection of the vagina and also to prevent invasion by the organisms which can ascend up to the cervix and the uterus and fallopian tubes so you have the stuff stratified squamous epithelium then we have the inflammatory reaction and coming to the normal vaginal flora we know that the dodelin's bacillus and uh, which produces the lactic acid so lactobacillus is one of the most important natural vaginal microbiota in human body it has got a complex ecosystem of more than 200 bacterial species which live as commensals in the vagina they are influenced by genes also ethnic background different people from different ethnicity contain different types of lactobacillus so uh, the um, black americans and the white caucasians the asians they have different strains strains of lactobacillus and also they are influenced by gene polymorphism and environmental and behavioral factors as in other cases also play a very important role in the maintenance of the vaginal microbiota so the vagina there is a support a defense system together with antibacterial substances cytokines defenses against infections so the lactobacilli how they bring about protection of the vagina and produce an acidic ph and prevent vaginal infections so act as a biosurfactant so they inhi inhibit the additions of pathogens to the vagina they produce lactic acid and the hydrogen peroxide they maintain the acidic ph of the vagina they also produce bacteriocins which inhibits the growth of pathogen the complications which can arise due to vaginal infections mainly bacterial vaginosis we know that it can affect pregnancy and it can lead to preterm labor and also it can lead to um, post endometritis and it can also lead to cuff complications following hysterectomy so recurrent vaginal infection can lead to pid following abortion there can be pid cuff cellulitis following hysterectomy and with the presence of bacterial vaginosis there is more risk of hiv acquisition and transmission so treating bacterial vaginosis definitely brings down the risk of hiv acquisition and even other scds to a large extent 
So, so also the risk of HSV infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas infections, the other STDs also are brought down by treatment of the bacterial vaginosis. The pregnancy complications, second trimester miscarriage, premature rupture of membrane, preterm birth, postpartum endometritis, all can occur due to untreated symptomatic bacterial vaginosis. But there is a controversy, but they definitely say that there is no point in routinely screening for bacterial vaginosis. But if there is a previous history of bacterial vaginosis and you find bacterial vaginosis, you can treat. But there is no role of routine screening of all women when there is a uh, to look for asymptomatic bacterial vaginosis. But of course, symptomatic vaginal uh, bacterial vaginosis has to be treated. Tubal infertility also can be due to a bacterial vaginosis. The first person who found out about this lactic acid producing bacteria in the vagina is Albert Todelin. We all know about Todelin's bacillus and he was the first person who brought it so easy for us to understand and also how the vagina is protected. And even now, after a century also, there is no change. Dodelin's bacillus and the lactobacilli continue, except that we have found more than 200 species of lactobacilli. Then the Manu of Hurlin characterized the vaginal microbiota of children, pregnant women, non-pregnant, and old age women. Then we also know about the Gardner, Herman Gardner and Charles Dukes, who spoke about the bacterial vaginosis, which was initially called as Haemophilus vaginalis, later Gardnella vaginalis. Now we know that it is not just one organism, but multitude of organisms which are pathogenic to the vaginal flora. And that is now termed as the bacterial vaginosis. In the normal vaginal microbiota in the newborn, it is colonized by the vaginal microbiota of the mother. Later, the, from the skin and mouth, microbiota of the mother colonize the newborn. Mother's milk harbors lactobacilli, which is transferred to the suckling child. Then pre-pubertal, before menarche, the unsteady mix of skin and gut mi microbes, which may harbor some few lactobacilli, but not many. And then with the puberty and with the estrogens, the vaginal epithelium proliferates and glycogen. And um, we know that they, uh, it is converted into the lactic acid. And progesterone supports the cytolysis of the epithelial cells, which release glycogen. And lactobacilli and other bacteria metabolize this glycogen to glucose and maltose and further to lactic acid. So we know the normal pH is around 3.8 to 4.4. So these are all the different types of microbiota. I'm not going to detail. Crispetus, gasseri, and uh, they all produce bacteria science, biosurfactants, congregating molecules, inhibit addition, all these they produce. And the most important is the hydrogen peroxide and lactic acid. That prevents the bacterial vaginosis. And we know that white Caucasian women have lactobacillus inus, Asian have lactobacillus crispatus, and Hispanic women have lactobacillus ginseng. The gene polymorphisms, the polymorphism in the interleukin 1 receptor or uh, antagonist gene or the toll like receptor, and this gene polymorphism as the innate recognition of the gram-negative bacteria it enables, it influences the quantity of vaginal bacteria and influence individual susceptibility to pregnancy complications. Some of the women with bacterial vaginosis do not experience any pregnancy complications, even if they harbor the bacterial vaginosis, but some land up in preterm labor and miscarriage and postpartum infections. So that could probably be explained by the gene polymorphisms in present in those group of women. So the changes in the vaginal flora, so the normal bacillus or the lactobacillus, how it gets altered is when there is use of antibiotics, corticosteroids, cytostatics, antivirals, antifungals, irradiation, and vaginal douching. Some of the women are, they think that the vaginal hygiene is very important and they do regular douching and that disturbs the normal vaginal flora following surgery, when there is a cyst or polyp in the vagina, immunosuppressive conditions, and from aging when the estrogen becomes less, or if there is a foreign bodies like um, <clears throat> tampons, or if there is a um, pessary, or even IUCD, these can all lead to changes in the vaginal flora. Use of spermicides as a vaginal method of contraception also can lead to changes in the vaginal flora. Added to this, all the deodorants and all the perfumes which are used for, by the women these days that can also change the vaginal flora. Coming to the vaginitis, 
this is this uh, vaginitis by definition is the disorders of the vagina caused by infection, inflammation, or changes in the normal flora. How is vaginitis different from vaginosis? See, uh, the bacterial vaginosis, it is called as bacterial vaginosis and not vaginitis because there is, unlike in candida, trichomonas, there is no inflammation in these conditions. So that is why it's called as a group of organisms producing a vaginosis without inflammatory changes. The, the symptoms of vaginitis could be discharge. These are all very important because in order to identify a particular organism, we should take the history into great detail when a patient comes to us about the type of vaginal discharge, whether it is malodorous, whether there is pruritus, or there is a discomfort, or there is a pain. And what are all the destructive factors are sexually transmitted diseases, foreign body, estrogen level as in menopause, use of hygienic practices, pregnancy, sexual activity, and some contraceptive choices. So the common infections are the candida vulvovaginitis, trichomoniasis, and the bacterial vaginosis, which comes to around 90%. Next remaining will be cervicitis from STD, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and mycoplasma. The non-infectious etiology for this will be vaginal atrophy, foreign body irritants and allergens, of course, systemic medical disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus also can lead to a disturbance in the vaginal flora and produce a vaginal infection. So I will not go into the details of this because this is a basic um, history which we take when a patient comes to us and just go rapidly rush through the three main types here, the bacterial vaginosis, candidiasis, and trichomoniasis. In this, we find that the symptoms vaginal discharge, clinical findings, pH, WIF test, and the um, uh, sodium chloride or the 0.9% saline wet mouth. These are very, very important. Sad to state that we are not doing the, uh, the microscope has gone away from the outpatient, which was a very important uh, equipment. Those days when for in, in Leucoria clinic, we used to use the microscope, diagnose properly whether it is TB or whether it is uh, candida or bacterial vaginosis, and then give the initial treatment. But even in a government hospital, that was the norm about three decades ago. It has gone away. But even now, this is coming back. They say having a microscope definitely helps in a very evidence-based treatment, finding out clearly what is the first level so that we don't over-treat and produce antibiotic resistance in so, so many patients who have a normal vaginal discharge. The normal vaginal discharge will be clear to white, 4 to 5 ml per day per 24 hours, and it is not maybe having slight odor, but not malodorous, and it is not associated with any pruritus or burning sensation. So when the normal vaginal discharge, some patients, uh, even they observe, they think that normal vaginal discharge is abnormal. They come and that is, it's a practice when a patient says itching or she says some slight irritation, we may not do all these tests and we may be just giving it some empiric treatment with all these medications, which will take care of all the three organisms. So that maybe that has led to all these antibiotic resistance and the recurrence of the condition. So the, depending on the order, the discharge and the itch. So here it is malodorous and the trichomonas also, it is malodorous. The itch is very severe in candidiasis, trichomoniasis, and even in bacterial vaginosis. And here it is a homogeneous grayish white and fishy odor. Here thick, clumpy, white cottage cheese and trichomonas yellowish green malodorous. Clinical findings in the trichomonas, we find strawberry cervix. In bacterial vaginosis, no inflammation of the vulva or vagina. But in candidiasis, we may find erythema and inflammation. pH, normal is acidic. In bacterial vagino, it, vaginosis, it is, goes towards the alkaline, more than 4.5. Candidiasis, it is less than 4.5. Candidiasis occurs premenstrual, whereas bacterial vaginosis and trichomonasis occur in the menstrual and postmenstrual period when it becomes more of an alkalinity. The most important test, fifth test, that when you add the KOH to the uh, discharge, if there is a uh, foul smelling fishy odor or the positive amine test or the BIF test, then we know it is a bacterial vaginosis. Maybe we may get a little bit of the positive uh, smell in trichomonas as well. That wet amount of sodium um, normal saline is very, very important because that is very important for the motile flagellated protozoa that is a trichomoniasis. 
and within 20 minutes we'll have to examine otherwise the motility will decrease so the candidiasis we may find hyphae because the koh destroys all the other cellular debris everything and only the hyphae and the spores become prominent and the different types of the candidiasis can also be made out the spore forming ones by this test so the microscopic test is a still holds good even now six steps of assessment this is also basic you bear with me i'll rush through fast first find out what is anatomic site remember that more than one condition it may be a combination of infection evaluate each symptom separately discharge find, find out what is it itching pain evaluate the vaginal secretions with both ph and wet mud this ph is something which people are still practicing abroad but um, i could not find a ph paper which is narrow range 4.5 which ordinary litmus paper is a higher range but we may have to use a litmus paper maybe i would like the dermatologist or the um, rti specialist to clarify that today because that is also a very important test and uh, even the people say oh the telephonic conversation uh, conversation with the patients abroad they say just take the ph paper and yeah, find scrape and scrape on the side and then find whether it is a 4.5 or less than 4.5 and then if it is less than 4.5 do treat for candida so that is how it is being treated and that also has led to lot of abuse of the use of antibiotics so i again one more important thing is just Dr. Dr. Is Dr. Dr. i think three more minutes sir they just wanted to remind you of the time okay okay only three more minutes sir yeah fine okay then i will uh, just Im uh, important i am not going to detail because this everybody knows about the assessment uh, the symptom diagnostic testing and empirical therapy based on history and physical examination alone should be avoided that is the take home message which i am trying to tell history and physical examination based on that treatment should be avoided so misdiagnosis and in in inappropriate therapy can occur so here candidiasis again this is a repetition i am not going to history physical examination ph wet mud if test so this in detail i am not telling because i have already mentioned about the ph wet mud and the wif test if you don't find any of these and you find vulvo vaginal atrophy in a menopausal postmenopausal treat the vaginal atrophy so 25 to 40% will not have a specific cause and um, this is again going into all details about the bacterial vaginosis and if you find dysuria and dyspareunia it may be an inflammatory disorder or it may be allergy or vulvo vaginal atrophy if you the premenstrual period i said about the candida vulva vaginitis immediately after the tv and bv immediately after sexual contact std after gynec surgery surgical complications or fistula assess the estrogen status look at the vulva whether edema fissures all these things are present on any warty lesions in the vagina speculum examination is a very important examination where you can look at vaginal warts and uh, any other infections and uh, malignancy the characteristics of the vaginal discharge should be studied into detail one more important when you are doing a bimonial examination there is a pelvic pain look for the patient may be having a myofascial pelvic pain syndrome that is also not uncommon there there are trigger points we rarely go into the details but in clinical uh, practice i have seen many people come complaining of pain when we touch one area the pain radiates to the buttock or to the thigh so look into myofascial pelvic pain syndrome and the diagnostic studies are these showing all the details of various trichomonas the yeast forms the hyphae and the nodulated flagella these are the clue cells which are all the coccobacilli on the vaginal epithelium which are seen on the wet mount preparation and also the gram stain the criteria for diagnosing bacterial vaginosis is the uh, amsels criteria where there is a vaginal discharge smell and the ph or the nugen criteria where we look for the lact the ratio of the Um, lactobacilli and if it is 0 to 3 it is normal 4 to 6 it is uh, suggestive of the bacterial vaginosis more than 6 it is definitely a bacterial vaginosis a good history is a very important one pruritus you have to take pain if there is a pain rule out sexually transmitted diseases and also pid and watery discharge beware of fallopian tube carcinoma which is a latsko triad watery vaginal discharge where there could be what is called as hydrops tube effluence and also there could be a bleeding 
And when there is an introital pain with the discharge, think about vestibular dynia. So vestibular dynia and pelvic myofascial syndrome are two important things which we should not forget. And if there is persistent mal genital malodor, think of ulcers, fistula, or it may be urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence or malignancies. So bacterial vaginosis, I had spoken again uh, and given the salient features. Now coming to the biofilm, these are all adhesive forms of uh, the, it, the bacteria adhere to the vaginal epithelium, then forms the scaffolding to which other species adhere. And these, after forming the biofilm, it is resistant to the effect of the antibiotics. So going against this, probably these uh, probiotics and these conditions will help in crossing these biofilms and along with antibiotic treatment and bring about reduction in the symptoms of these patients with vaginitis. So adverse effects of the um, um, infections are the zudomembranous colitis and clindamine resistance and, and the clindamycin can have effect on the latex condom gloves and it can be uh, very not very um, effective, the contraception. The probiotics are live microorganisms. And today I'll be touching a little bit about the probiotics. They are the microorganisms that confirm a health benefit on the host when administered in adequate amounts. So it is an adjunct to antibiotics for BV and prevention of relapse. And the prebiotics are the organ, um, uh, oligosaccharides, which help in the growth of the uh, probiotic or the um, uh, bacteria which are beneficial in the GIT. Uh, lactulose is an example of a prebiotic. And the, 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 the combinum tablets which contain lactobacillus is an example of a probiotic. So uh, whenever there is an antibiotic given, uh, these uh, probio prebiotics and probiotics are helpful. Coming I'm to the type of... Wind up, uh... Yeah, I'm winding up. I think I started late only, no? Because of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, yes, I started yeah, yeah. late. Yeah, I started very late. Hardly, I think, 15 minutes are over. So one more thing I want to talk about um, uh, candidiasis is uh, the uncomplicated disease. Maybe when there is a mild or moderate candidiasis, it occurs sporadically and uh, the organism's candida albicans and the host is normal. Here, complicated vulvovaginal is a recurrent disease more than three per year and severe non-albican species. And the host can be having other diseases like diabetes, recurrent infections, because treatment of both are different in uncomplicated disease and a, a complicated disease. And uh, in case of recurrent uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis, what you should do is you, the treatment has to be repeated for a long term. If you are giving a fluconazole, uh, instead of giving single dose, after 72 hours, repeat the dose for three doses. And if it's still persistent after two weeks, then repeat the dose every week for about six months. So that is definitely a superior and uh, less toxic uh, compared to ketoconazole. And so in that way, the fluconazole can be uh, treated for, um, for the recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. And they also found that the other groups, itraconazole is helpful and the vaginal boric acid tablets. But vaginal boric acid tablet is available in India, but unfortunately we don't have experience in using it. Um, I found that uh, some consultants used to use it in US. They used to make the boric acid tablets and for recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, non-albicans type of um, candida, it has been found to be useful. So this is the complicated infections. You can you have myconazole, mistatin, and itraconazole, and the recurrent vagina uh, I, for paucity of time. I will not be going, but it, it is uh, definitely you have to do an induction course of recurrent 150 milligram every 72 hours for three doses, followed by maintenance dose of. 150 milligram once per week for six months. This is the treatment for recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. And the non-albicans candida, this is from up to date. So they are still recommending intravaginal boric acid. I looked up and Googled and found in boric acid is available as tablet in even in our country. And maybe we can try, but it's very, very toxic if taken orally and it should be kept away from children. So that, that boric acid is another line of treatment with, which is available. And we know that topical clotrimazole, myconazole in pregnancy is useful even for seven days. So male partners, should we treat the male partners with the patients with bacterial vaginosis and candida albicans? Um, sometimes the male partners harbor the candida and the patients can be 
um, infected again and again, even though it is not a sexually transmitted disease. And even bacterial vaginosis is not considered to be a sexual transmitted disease. And treatment of the asymptomatic male partner has not been found to improve the um, uh, success in the treatment of the female or prevent recurrence. So except the TB, where the female male partner or the, um, the spouse is treated, these two, it is questionable unless there is a symptomatic male partner. So here in um, the other treatment is discomatic. This is very important one, which I want to tell. When you don't find anything, and there are people who are in the perimenopausal age group coming with excessive discharge and you don't find it's not trichomonas, it is not uh, candidiasis, not bacterial vaginal, not malignancy, but it could be discomative inflammatory vaginitis, lots of vaginal discharge. And for that, you have to be, there are some criteria to be followed to diagnose. You should rule out other infections, 100%. Um, then you can treat with 2% clindamycin cream or 10% hydrocortisone cream. And there is wonderful effect in these patients. And I've seen uh, only one patient with a discomative inflammatory vaginitis. This patient, she responded very well to the clindamycin cream. And uh, that 10% uh, hydrocortisone is not available. So you, it has to be prepared. Madam, uh, it's 26 minutes since you started. Okay. So this is 26, sir? Okay, fine. I'm just finishing. This I've already mentioned prebiotic. And the person I want to uh, remember and pay respect to this person, Eli Mechnikov, he brought that probiotic. And um, he introduced that in the curd, the fermentation of the milk, the curd, and how it is useful in maintaining a long life. So following that, a lot of probiotics have been discovered and they produce lactic acid, acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and they do the work of the lactobacilli and they maintain the normal vaginal flora or do the work of the normal vaginal flora. And Foxy even recommends the treatment with the lactic acid, uh, the probiotic in treatment of the recurrent vaginal infections. So they are adjuvants to antibiotic therapy. Many, many literature are available, but some um, articles have shown no effect, but good effect with the probiotic has come back. And I feel that in the, in the course of time, there will be um, lots of infections, these recurrent infections, which are going to be treated with the probiotics. Definitely in the IVF treatment, the probiotics have been found to be very useful in prevention miscarriage in the success of the IVF treatment. So these are just the studies. I will not be going into detail. And bacterial vaginosis has been found to cause the tubal infertility. And preclinical -pre -pre pregnancy loss also has been reduced by the treatment of probiotics along with the infertility treatment. And the tip of the catheters. So this is definitely a lot of studies on the prebiotics and probiotics. It will be very useful for the postgraduate students if they know that. And I would like to conclude by saying that uh, one probiotic which we know, maybe many brands are there, which contains all these lactobacillus and they have been found to be um, uh, helpful for patients with the recurrent valvovaginitis. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for that um, wonderful talk. It's a very common condition actually. So. And a very important point, you said that we should have a microscope in the gynae OPD that gives more rational treatment than blind treatment. For most of the time, the treatment for wide discharge is a blind treatment. So rational treatment will be there if we have a microscope. Like what you said is right. Earlier, we used to have a microscope in gynae OPD. Nowadays, we don't do it often. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I don't think we have any questions. I think we can yeah. skip the question. Maybe and even later also, if they put the questions question. in the yeah. chat box, maybe we can, we can. take yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you, uh, Chair. Yeah. Thank Pazman you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Padmini Prasad for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for both the speakers. Uh, we are so extremely sorry. I know this is a vast learning things, uh, but because of the time constraint, sticking to the time. So I'd like to uh, in, uh, invite the next chairperson for the next session, uh, Dr. K. Srinivas, again, a well-known person uh, in the Bangalore and the, he's a 
faculty professor in OBG uh, from Bangalore Medical College, gold medalist MBBS and MMC Mysore. He has many uh, uh, papers and presentations, and he is a uh, best paper award in international conference in emergency obstetrics. Fellow in Indian College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, he has more than ten papers and edited many books. Thank you, sir, and welcome. And like to introduce the next chairperson, Dr. Narayan Swami. Again, one more. Uh, uh, when I was doing my PG, these both people were the teaching faculty in Bangalore Medical College. Welcome you, sir. He is the medical Thank director you. of Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, senior consultant Vegas Hospital. Has carried out more than twenty thousand laparoscopic surgery free of cost to the patient in rural areas of Bangalore. Since last ten years, conducting free plastic surgeries camp along with NGO in in his hospitals with the involvement of expert surgeons from Germany. Successfully conducted more than thousand five hundred surgeries. He is he has so many membership. to the many societies welcome you sir thank you so much thank you dr manjunath uh, for those kind words um, i think we always neglect the path through which we traversed uh, and i think most of us have traveled through this uh, great pathway vagina and uh, due respects have been given to this organ uh by dr padmini prasad and i thank her for this opportunity and more than anything i would like to say um it's a great honor i re- i am really humbled by this opportunity because i would be chairing a session in which my teacher is going to speak that is professor bafna would be speaking so um i would like to really ask his permission to chair this session it's it's really a very humbling experience for me um i think we can um, straight away start with the uh, first session can, uh, can we introduce the um, first speaker can the slide be uh, projected yeah um i remember my teacher telling um the diseases of the skin are seen on the skin by the dermatologist but sir professor venkatramana sir we gynecologists would see the diseases of sin on the fallopian so most often our uh, clients would be asymptomatic with many of the diseases a time was there when people used to say um, if you know about syphilis you know everything in medicine i think now it has evolved to if you know about probably hiv you know everything in uh, uh um, medicine probably it is the one which involves uh, most of the uh, systems so you are talk very relevant uh, what was the exterior scenario and compared to the today's scenario so here uh, we have professor venkatramana retired professor and hod of osmania medical college more than 35 years of experience uh, in teaching uh, he has a, a doctorate in sexual medicine also a diploma in sexual counseling first president elect of uh, telangana state dvl uh, he is actually a member of quite a few uh, associations he is a who fellow twice in stds and ia aids i think dr padmini has found the best person to deliver this lecture he is uh, the council member for asia oceana federation of sexology uh, he has won a golden lamp award for uh, which is the highest honor in the field of indian sexology congratulations sir he is a fellow of council of sex education and parenthood international so the next 20 minutes is yours please enlighten us about the topic that is yesterday versus today's scenario in sti and rti over to dr venkatramana respected chairpersons and my colleague dr padmini prasad good morning and thanks for inviting me this august body my dear friends the topic given to me is sexually transmitted infections or reproductive tract infections yester years and current year scenario i have conveniently divided this into scenario before world war 2 seen after world war 2 before going to that scenario 
all these sexually transmitted diseases or infections are nothing but a group of infectious diseases predominantly transmitted from person to person through sexual or intimate in contact. If you look the scenario, scenario before World War II, it's a really a big mystery how they, these infections entered in the human kingdom, how the human beings suffered, how, how they got it. It's a mystery. It's a chicken and egg story, never resolves. But the anthropological evidences are there to say that these diseases have been acquired by humans through animals. These diseases are endemic an animals. Animal kingdom has suffering, suffered and suffering even today. From there, the human beings got it. But the medical history shows there are two theories proposed how the human beings got these diseases into human kingdom. One theory is pre-Columbian theory. Second one is Columbian theory. Pre-Columbian theory says, yes, these diseases came from the animal kingdom and entered into the human kingdom, remained as an endemic disease. From that endemicity, they have evolved into the epidemiological status, epidemicity. Whereas Columbian theory says that these diseases were there in America, Native Americans, and Columbus has traveled there to who did, uh, accidentally discovered America. From there, he brought the disease back to Europe and it has spread entire Europe and it has become a pandemic in the 4th and 5th centuries. That's how the STDs have started evolving into the human beings. Till World War II, only five types of diseases were there. Namely, as rightly told by our previous, our Srinivas sir, that syphilis is the great pox. In those days, it is called as a great pox. After that, only we got small pox because that pox was smaller than the great pox. That's why the name is given as small pox. Syphilis is called great pox. So syphilis is the first disease, then followed Ganeria, Shankaroid, LGV, and granuloma inguinal. These are all the five diseases that were there up till World War II. They are also called as first generation STDs. This document which I procured from the Office of the Community War Services Federal Security Agency of Washington, this clearly shows that how much was rampant in syphilis in those days. And this syphilis in India is called as a Portuguese disease or Ferengi disease or Ferengi roga because it is a Portuguese people who introduced syphilis to India through Vasco de Gama. Vasco de Gama who discovered India brought syphilis to India through, entered into the Kerala from Cochin. From there it has spread entire India. And the record clearly shows that Ganeria and Shankarad was there during Second World War from the American and the British Army. And at the same time, historically, donovanosis and lymphogranuloma venerium were discovered in India. Those were there in India and the scientists were treating doctors, particularly army doctors. Both are army doctors. One was uh, serving at Kolkata, one was serving at Madras Regiment. They discovered the causative agent. They named the disease in their respective soldiers. From there, they spilled into the uh, civilians. Donovanosis in 1980, in, I'm sorry, in 1881 by Kenneth McLeod, a Scottish physician. He named it as serpiginous ulcer. He entered, and Donovan, Charles Donovan, they demonstrated the Donovan bodies in the exudates of the lesions. Whereas in 1902, Caddy is the first to discover LGB yeah, under the name of Climactric Bibo from the Madras Medical College. And this document again clearly shows the rampant here, what you call virulence of the syphilis. In the World War II, in the first two years of World War II, Japanese killed 36,000 American soldiers, whereas syphilis alone killed 33,000 soldiers. See the amount of rampantness or the virulence of syphilis in those days during World War. And the situation in India at the time in the World War II report clearly shows 
from 1949 to 1952 showed the syphilis to be the most common STI followed by gonorrhea. And in 1970, there was a the government uh, in those days, the first federal government report clearly shows that we Indian people are 8 to 10 percent of the population is having syphilis in those days. So 8 to 10 percent is a very huge proportion. Anything above 1 percent is considered to be as an epidemic, epidemic proportion. It is 8 to 10 percent in those days. So that speaks volumes about the rampantness of the syphilis. So this is how the syphilis manifests. And these are the clinical photographs. Since it is the only female topic, I am speaking to Foxy. That's why I am focusing only female clinical clinical slides. So this, this one, Shankaradal ulcers. See the Shankaradal ulcer. See the granuloma inguinal, uh, serpiginous ulcer. Then granuloma, I'm sorry, LGV, lymphogranuloma venerium. See the transient ulcer here. See the bubo here, ruptured bubo. So this is the lymph, lymph, lymph stasis of the vulva, yeah, ultimate manifestation of LGV. After the World War II, the scenario totally changed. Now the people started <coughs> experimenting sexually. Sexual revolution came. This sexual revolution came because of the various sociological factors and biological factors. Whatever may be the factors which I am going to discuss in after a few minutes, the epidemiological trend clearly shows that rising trend of STDs in the STI. STI if this, this slide clearly shows the census from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, always there is a rising trend. So that clearly shows, in spite of so many available STD specialists in government clinics and private sector services, yet the diseases are increasing year by year. So this is again CDC report. This is a worldwide, there is an uptrend only. So this clearly shows the sexual revolution is going on and the people are experimenting and getting sexually transmitted diseases. Then, in spite of these services that are available in India and are abroad in everywhere, in every country, yet it is increasing means the only hitch here is all these diseases will not manifest clinically. Asymptomatism is the commonest manifestation. Because of asymptomatism, many patients doesn't know that they are suffering or they are having disease. disease. Particularly female race, from 50% to 70%, they won't have any symptoms. They are asymptomatic carriers. And if you look at this slide, clearly shows sexually active age group is the commonest age where they are suffering with this, this disease. This again worldwide trend showing the all continents of the world a rising trend in these STDs. And here again clearly, because after the World War II, lot of antibiotics came into the ESA, sulfonamide, stratocyclines, penicillin. As a result, the bacterial STD is coming down. Viral STDs are increasing year by year. This is again another trend. Viral STDs are uptrending. Bacterial STDs are downtrending here. Why these sexual experimentation has increased? Our sexual revolution has come means because of now any for the male is the perpetrator, male is known for experimentation. But after World War II, female also started doing this because women came into workforce. People, women came, became educated and joined in doing jobs and helping the rising the economy, economy of the home as well as the economy of the country. So as a result, women came into workforce, then there is a chance for experimentation. Another area clue, uh, what is called uh, reason for experimentation is availability of oral contraceptives that came into usage into the humans. The oral contraceptives give a false belief into the human, particularly women, they saying that now I am safe, I won't get pregnant if I do sexual experimentation. So, as a result, experimentation has increased in the community. Third, availability of the cure because of the availability of the penicillin, tetracyclines, and sulfonamides, sepran in those days, 
So these available antibiotics made the people to cure these diseases. Hence, there is a false belief that the false sex, sense of security are making them to do sexual experimentation. At the same time, air travel started. People started traveling from country to country, continent to continent. And hippie liberalization was a peak after the Second World War. So free exchange of sexual experimentation. As a result of all these factors, women too started sexual experimentation. As a result, few more diseases joined the human kingdom. Apart from the original five diseases that were there in the before World War II, now some more added to the human kingdom, namely non-gonococcal cervicitis, erythritis, chlamydial genital infections, genital herpes, genital warts, trichomoniasis, pediculosis pubis, scabies, genital molluscum contagiosum. So this is how the MC genital molluscum contagiosum, this herpetic infection, say the grouped vesicular infection, painful vesicles and bursting and producing painful ulcers, see the extensive painful ulcers of the vulva and vagina, see the swelling of the vulva, is HPV, genital warts, see the growths, See the extensive growth of genital warts. This extensive growth is called Busky Levenstein's tumor, a potentially malignant condition caused by HPV and the skin and the vulva. Then next comes the uh, another disease. This is vulva. Here it is. Both infections are there, mixed infection, whereas warts as well as MC. Next comes the MC molluscum contagiosum and pox virus that is occurring in the genitalia. Is extensive pox mollusci. Next comes the itching, itchy papular, more on the nocturnal na, na, night times, so more nocturnal time, and other family members will be affected. Case of genital scabies, scabies affecting the genitalia, vulva, see the labia, see the gluteal area, and next is the pediculosis pubis affecting the pubic hair. This is extensive pediculosis here. So these are all the reasons that made the people to do experimentation and paved way for the second generation STDs, namely herpes, HPV, molluscum, pediculosis, KBs, chlamydia. Then in 70s, particularly 72 to 75, the next revolution started, namely gay sexual revolution, LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual and queer. So this movement has pick, picked up in the entire world and more so in India in a very slow, clandestine way. Now after the Supreme Court scraping this homosexual act, now it has come up openly. Now it is the, not in the clandestine way, it is an open way revolution is occurring. As a result of this gay sexual revolution way, the experimentation started in a multiple ways. Previously, pino vaginal sex was the only way. Now people started experimenting oro anal, oro vaginal, pino anal, pino, pino oral, like multiple combinations and permutations. As a result of this, anal pathogens entered the genital area, oral pathogens entered the genital area. Genital pathogens enter the oral cavity like this exchange of organism, hormonal organism environment has occurred. As a result of this, some more diseases came into doctor's armamentorium or human kingdom. These are all hepatitis B, hepatitis A, salmonella, shigella, giardiasis, amoebiasis, Bonococcal proctitis and pharyngitis, anal warts and anal hepatic infections, chlamydial proctitis, and a syndrome cropped up from a mixture of all this called gay bevel syndrome. So this we consider as third generation STDs. So put together now more than 25 diseases are over. So now see the oral STDs entering into oral cavity. See the oral growth, oral ulcers, oral HPV infection, anal ulcers, anal herpetic infections, anal HPV, anal warts. See the anal warts, anal warts. So like this, 
the people are not happy even at this stage they started still experimenting the social behavioral revolution has occurred in 1980s and what still occurring even today as a result of this social behavioral revolution now delay in marriage and early sexual experimentation usage of contraceptives has increased and in giving a false sense of security and the emergency contraception came into usage and it has taken away the fear of pregnancy new culture of living together culture as now is the prevalent in the in every society of the world and women also started taking alcohol and smoking and titillating effects of that and doing experimentation and half late multiple sexual partners are becoming is more common society accepting nowadays in many societies even in metros in india increasing premarital and extramarital sex is has becoming very common nowadays dating apps have come almost 12 dating apps are available in india more than 150 dating apps are available throughout the world casual sexual sex culture has become a norm nowadays in metros usage of otc antibiotics and not coming for a testing just rely on the google dr google google baba has become the godfather for these people at the same time usage of more intimate personal products have been increased more douching vaginal douche as a result the vaginal environment is getting changed and making susceptible for more stds as a result of all these factors so these are all the you know apps that are available dating apps these are available in india the tinder dating app is highly logged in dating app as a result premarital extramarital mixing of sexes taking alcohol and smoking all these have increased in the of late as a result paving for ex sexual experimentation as a result of this fourth generation stds have come namely hiv and aids pandemic apart from that even hep c hepatitis c cytomegalo htlv mycoplasma mobilincus and hsv type 8 that causing kaposi sarcoma so these are all viral infections that came after this social behavioral revolution put together now today my friends now today we are having more than 30 bacterial viral parasitic infections that are there in the human kingdom since many are asymptomatic we are calling it as sti's sti means in covering the asymptomatic area also people who are suffering clinical manifestations are there we use the term std so all these that more than 30 diseases are caused by only five types of organisms namely bacterial viral protozoal ectoparasite and fungi so these are all the bacterial infections these are all the viral infections these are all the protozoal parasitic and fungal infections that are so making the people to suffer that are there in the human kingdom predominantly transmitted to from person to person the roots of transmission is as i rightly told predominantly sexual intercourse that is the commonest route once the person got it through sexual intercourse if he donates the blood so through blood transfusion these infections can go to other person or if they share the injection needles because of the drug drug addict habits through injection needles it goes to other person or if this person who is having who acquired sexually transmitted infection through sexual intercourse if she becomes pregnant it goes to the offspring through vertical transmission or this disease can be transmitted through tattoo needles also at the same time we healthcare providers inadvertently we may get injured while treating these patients 
doctors, obstetricians performing the vaginal deliveries, cesareans, surgeons, dental people, to nurses, paramedical staff. Inadvertently, we may get injured, called needle stick injuries, through which we run a little risk is there that also can be worn off by taking universal health precautions. So predominantly sexual route followed by infected blood transfusion, blood product route. Third is IV drug abuse, contaminated needle fruit. Fourth is vertical transmission from mother to child and skin to skin. Then comes the needle stick injuries for healthcare providers. So these are all the documented ways through which these STDs or STIs will be transmitted from person to person. Any sir, person who is suffering with this STI, we sir, take it as a... two more minutes, sir. Right, I'll rush through. Marker for high risk behavior of HIV infection because people who are suffering the STDs are more prone to acquire and to transmit sexually HIV infections. In India, 35 to 36 million episodes are occurring annually. Uh, for every second, one patient is uh, suffering with this STDs. As I told you, asymptomatic is the commonest mode. Then complications and ulcers, growths and discharges. These are all the commonest manifestations. Previously called venereal diseases. Now we are calling STI or STDs, reproductive tract infections. So this is 17% of people, various biological factors. And this there was a control program before independence started by British people to save their army people, they started national control program and it was there and it's merged with the national HIV control program in 1992. Now today in India, we are having 1,160 STRTA clinics uh, called Suraksha Clinic. More than 5,000 private clinics, they are uh, giving services to these needy people and there are a lot of training programs are going on in the country. A lot of regional STD laboratories are there. And these are all the ways through which we can control these infections. Unless our Indian citizens are rather, for that matter, all human beings, if they control their sexual urges, not practicing sexual experimentation, they cannot be eliminated. Through medical treatment, we can control these infections through therapeutic intervention, behavioral intervention, structural intervention. These are the ways we can do this. A lot of elaborate investigations will help us in doing this. Unless we treat the partner, the treatment not is complete because these infections are from person to person. For example, a patient comes to you, you have to inquire from where he got to whom they, he has given. So from where he got, we have to treat to whom we have given, we have to treat. Then only the treatment is complete. That's how the expected treatment and the link between HIV and this STDs is very much needed today. And uh, my friends, to sum up, April is the month for STD Awareness Month. We have to talk to the people, we have to test the people, we have to treat the people. Then only we can come to, we can control these infections. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you very much, sir, for that excellent uh, deliberation on the evolution of STIs uh, across the globe and, of course, in India. Um, to, to, to just look it at a lighter side, um, experimentation or curiosity is the one which brings up a lot of inventions and discoveries here. Ironically, it has brought in a lot of That's STIs. Yeah, I think that's the irony of the whole thing. Yeah. And I don't one think... Side, we... One side of the coin, oh, Vasco de Gama discovered India. Other side of the coin, he bought syphilis also. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. sir. So I really thoroughly enjoyed the lecture. And uh, I think uh, the questions could be taken on the uh, last uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I think Dr. Narayan Swami has to uh, say anything on this. Narayan Swami, sir? Yeah. Want to say anything Hello. on this session? Yeah, please, sir. Are you able to hear me, Dr. Sinwas? After a long time, I am seeing you on video. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are Maybe you, sir? Maybe after 10, 15 years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we were together in one and again we are sharing the session. Yes, So sir. it is a great opportunity for me to share a session with you. And also, uh, our great teacher like uh, Dr. Bapna is a great uh, academician, great surgeon. 
is a great teacher for all of us he taught uh, how to handle the malignancies and how to do surgeries and he was a consultant in our hospital also he taught me a lot of uh, surgeries and uh, i am very grateful to participate in this session and we, it is a learning session from dr bhapna sir so today bhapna sir is going to enlighten us on vaginal precancerous and cancerous lesions and its management so today is a learning session for all of us and uh, dr bhapna sir please kindly take over the session and uh, enlighten us on uh, vaginal cancer sir thank you sir thank you dr venkatramana for that uh, beautiful lecture as uh, as usual thank you madam thank you very kind of so i don't think this audience uh, requires any introduction of this great surgeon and teacher and speaker but still uh, as a formality i would just say a few words about bafna sir uh, he was uh, he was the head of uh, gynae oncology department at kidwai a uh, cancer institute presently the bm jain hospital gynec oncology head of the department um, i think he he graduated from uh, who belgam and did his post graduation from hubli and uh, uh he he has a membership of most of the um, gynae and onco organization he was instrumental in commencing mch gynae onco course in india and i am proud to be his student and i enjoy his lectures as i used to enjoy during my post graduation even today and over to you sir for the next 20 minutes thank you so much for the nice introduction and i would like to thank uh, dr padmini prasad and dr uh, and uh, bso ji for inviting me for this particular talk uh, i'll be talking on uh, a very uh, are you able to see my slides not yet not yet you have to share screen okay one second Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay. You can put it to slide show, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I will be uh, speaking on uh, uh, the vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia and invasive cervical invasive vaginal cancer. These are very extremely rare uh, cancers. Uh, vein and uh, vaginal cancers are very very rare gynecological cancers. Uh, pre-invasive lesions of the lower genital tract are classified into uh, vein category one, grade one, grade two, and grade three. These are the these are this was the older classification. Now I think the classification has changed uh, with the introduction of the last project, what is called as lower aerogenital squamous terminology, which was introduced by American Society of Colposcopy. and cervical pathology way back in 2012 so now we have two tier system instead of three tier system for all the spb associated squamous cell lesions of the anogenital tract that is cervix vagina vulva and anus so we have now two tier system we don't say cin1 cin2 and cin3 we just say l cell and h cell so there are only two categories for cervix vagina vulva and anus so we have only two tier classification l cell that is low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion it is usually not neoplastic it subsides on its own it is usually caused by low risk human papilloma virus infection which is not oncogenic on the other hand we have high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion that is cin involving the cervix vein involving the vagina vin involving the vulva these are the true neoplastic lesions because they are caused by oncogenic high risk human papilloma virus infection so hcl is truly neoplastic 
low grade lesions are usually not neoplastic and they do not require treatment usually because they subside on their own over a period of 6 to 12 months so while cervical cancers are common vaginal and vulval cancers are extremely rare and between the vulval cancer and vaginal cancer vaginal cancer is very very rare so cervical cancer is very common vaginal cancer is very very rare even though the lower genital tract is exposed to human papilloma virus equally so what is the etiology and risk factors for the development of vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia and vaginal cancer so vaginal cancers could be mainly because of hpv infection or sometimes it could be because of non hpv infection non hpv causes uh, they are the precursors of squamous cell cancer of vagina vein is a precursor of squamous cell cancer of vagina without vein you cannot have invasive cancer of vagina adenocarcinoma is very rare because there are no glands in the vaginal epithelium adenocarcinoma is rare because there are no true glands in the vaginal epithelium now compare uh, vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia cin lesions are common because uh, hpv infects the immature metaplastic cells which are present on the active transformation zone on the cervix whereas vein and uh, vulval intraepithelial neoplasias are uncommon because vaginal and vulval epithelium are mature vaginal and vulval epithelium are mature they do not have any transformation zone they do not have any immature cells therefore vaginal and vulval cancers are very very rare here you can see the calposcopic picture of cervix with the transformation zone so all cancers begin in the immature transformation zone cancers cannot begin in the mature squamous cells it cannot begin in the mature columnar cells it begins only in the immature transformation zone on the cervix and this immaturity is not present on the vagina and the vulva therefore cervical cancer is more common so mature vaginal and vulval epithelium is resistant to carcinogens like hpv so only when the epithelial integrity is breached can cancer develop so vaginal epithelium is mature if the epithelial integrity is breached for some reasons only then cancer can develop vaginal epithelium as i mentioned to you is extremely rare cancer just accounting for 1 to 2% of gynecological cancers very very rare hardly you see few cases in a year and most of the vaginal cancers are mainly metastatic cancers they are not primary cancers they are metastatic cancers from cervix endometrium ovaries or from rectum and bladder surrounding organs most of the vaginal cancers are metastatic from the surrounding organs primary cancers are very very rare and more than 90% of the vaginal cancers are obviously squamous cell cancer because vaginal epithelium is lined by squamous epithelium vaginal adenocarcinoma as i mentioned to you is very rare it arises from the vaginal glandular remnants arises from the vaginal glandular remnants or from adenoma caused by diethyl silvosterol which was used historically nowadays it is not used so we don't see vaginal adenomas very often nowadays because there is no use of des which was used for certain abortion way back in 1950s and vaginal clear cell cancer melanoma and sarcomas are extremely rare cancers now coming back to vein precursor of vaginal cancer any chronic irritation of vagina due to pessary any chronic pessary is left behind in the vagina any chronic infection chlamydia infection or any chronic infection trichomoniasis can result in damage of the mature vaginal epithelium and this mature epithelium is repaired by 
actively dividing immature cells. Whenever there is a uh, injury, there is a repair. So repair is done by actively dividing immature cells. And when these immature cells get infected by HPV, only then these immature cells can become vain. Only the immature cells can become dysplastic. Mature cells cannot become dysplastic. Only cells which are immature, dividing cells can become dysplastic and develop VAIN and invasive cervical cancer later if untreated. Now coming to incidence of vein, vein accounts for 0.4% of lower genital tract intraepithelial disease. It's uh, increased in uh, recent years because of increased incidence of HPV infection. Increased STDs, like the previous speaker was talking, because of increased uh, human papilloma virus incidence, the incidence of vein is increasing. Vein and vulval intraepithelial neoplasia are also increasing. Now compare it with uh, CIN. Vein uh, accounts for 0.2 per 1 lakh annual incidence, 0.2, very, very rare, almost non-existent. Whereas CIN accounts for 36 for 1 lakh. If you get 36 cases of CIN, you get only 0.2 cases of vein annually per lakh population. So rare. Now, how to diagnose? What is the clinical presentation? There are four types of vein. Majority of vein are found in women who have already had cervical precancer. So vein coexisting with the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia in 1 to 3%. So you have CIN, CIN extends to fornices very rarely in about 1 to 3 percent. CIN is normally confined to the transformation zone. It doesn't extend to fornices, but sometimes in 1 to 3 percent, it can extend to the vaginal fornices, causing vein. Sometimes uh, vein is diagnosed after treatment of CIN. About 70 percent of women with vein are diagnosed in patients who had hysterectomy for CIN or CA cervix. If you have done a hysterectomy for CIN or CA cervix, you have not removed the uh, carcinoma in situ present on the vagina, then patient will come back to you with vein or vaginal cancer. There also seems to be increased risk of vein in patients who have had vulval intraepithelial neoplasia or vulval cancer. So patients with vulval cancer also after treatment can have remnant vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia if the surgical margins were not adequate. So when uh, can also occur post irradiation. For example, suppose a patient has got cervical cancer. Cervical cancer patient has been treated with radiotherapy. After 15 to 20 years, patient can develop vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. It is because radiotherapy induced vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia occurring because of radiation induced injury occurs 10 to 15 to 20 years after, after radiotherapy. And the fourth group is in patients who are immunosuppressed. For example, patients who have HIV or chronic STDs, they can develop a vein. Now, age, age can be vary from 24 years to 80 years, depending on whether it is HPV induced or non HPV. HPV induced vein occurs at younger age. Non HPV induced vein occurs in older women. So, 70% of the HPV tumors are caused by HPV type 16. Type 16 is the most important cause for HPV induced vein. Now coming to the common sites, most of the vein and vaginal cancers are found in the upper vagina, upper one third of vagina. They are multifocal, multifocal and found in the upper one third of vagina. Middle and lower one third are less than 10%. So 90% are found in the upper vagina. Now diagnosis. The diagnosis of vein is difficult because they have no specific symptoms and signs mostly diagnosed accidentally during investigations for chronic vaginal infection or detected during investigation or post-treatment follow-up of cervical cancer and vulval cancer. After cervical cancer, after vulval cancer, to do follow-up. 
During follow up, you find that the pap smear is abnormal. Then you suspect vein. So when you suspect pain, uh, vein, you suspect vein in any patient with cervical cancer, the vulval cancer, or vulval precancer who has got persistent abnormal vaginal cytology after treatment. You have done hysterectomy, you have done a vulvectomy for vulval cancer, but vaginal cytology is abnormal. That means you must suspect a vein. So vaginal cytology is done from vaginal vault, scraping the vaginal vault and the vagina. And you can use LBC, liquid-based cytology, or you can use a conventional method of pap test for doing vaginal pap test. Similarly, uh, in, so sometimes you can have suspicious vaginal lesions, like you have non-healing vaginal ulcer, you have a growth in the vagina, or you have a congested spot in the vagina which bleeds and touch. So all these patients should be advised uh, carposcopic examination because they can harbor vein or vaginal cancer. The diagnosis confirmation is done by carposcopy directed biopsy. Carposcopy is like just like uh, cervix, but it is more difficult because uh, in cervix, carposcopy is, we concentrate only on the transformation zone. In vagina, we have to scan the entire vagina, which is difficult. So carposcopically, these lesions are usually astrovite with sharp borders, astrovite lesions with sharp borders and granular surface. What we do is entire vagina is washed with 5% acetic acid. We don't use 3%. We have to use 5% acetic acid, wash the entire vagina because cancer can occur anywhere. So many lesions are missed because they are get covered by speculum blades and vaginal rugosity. So you have to turn the speculum and better to use Schiller's test also with Lugol iodine because uh, it's important to rule out Schiller negative area, iodine negative area, which may indicate vein. Iodine negative area are very obvious compared to osteo-white areas. So you should use Schiller's test also. And biopsy of the suspected lesion is done under local anesthesia because you should take a punch biopsy which is possible only under local anesthesia. And you should include vaginal stroma or lamina propria. So you should take a deep biopsy, which includes the lamina propria or vaginal stroma. You should not take only superficial biopsy. You should take a deep biopsy under anesthesia. Now, these are the pictures of calposcopy. You can see dense osteoid multifocal lesions, dense osteoid patch, sharp borders, diagnostic of vein. Here also you can see astro-white patches with mosaic pattern, multifocal lesions. So vaginal cancers are usually multifocal found in the upper vagina. Here, where is coexisting with CIN? This is the cervix. This is the endocervical canal. This is the vaginal fornix. This is the vagina. You can see coarse punctation and mosaic pattern here in the fornix. So here CIN is extending CIN is extending to the furnaces. Very rarely, CIN extends to furnaces in 1 to 3 percent cases. 5 percent acetic acid is better than 3 percent acetic acid because vaginal epithelium is tough epithelium. So, better to use 5 percent acetic acid. Here, along with the acetic acid, you should use Schiller's test also because it becomes very obvious. Schiller negative area become very obvious. So use Schiller's test also. Now, when after hysterectomy, when following hysterectomy uh, for CIN is very, very uncommon. Occurs in 1 to 3 percent. For hysterectomy done for CIN. A persistent cellular abnormality in the vaginal sphere will alert to the fact that patient has got vein. Okay, here you can see here after hysterectomy, the vaginal vault. This is called dog's ear. You can see a white epithelium here. Very, it can be very easily missed because it is present in one corner of the vaginal vault. So you should be very careful to examine the, the vaginal vault, what is called as dog's ear, laterally. Look for any osteo-white epithelium after hysterectomy for CIN. Now here and here you can see, uh, this is the vaginal vault. 
Schiller positive, no vein. This is the granulation tissue after hysterectomy. This is the granulation tissue with astrovite epithelium. This is the granulation tissue with punctation indicating vein. This is a frank growth at the vaginal vault indicating frank invasive cancer. These are the dog ears. These are the what is called as dog's ear. So most common site for vein is the dog's ear. This can be very easily missed. Vein can be very easily missed in this area unless you look for it. Now treatment of vein, we have got four options: laser, electrocautery, or excise. You can excise it if possible. And most often, you know, use this radiation because it's easily available. Laser is not easily available. Electrocautery may not be very effective. Excision is difficult because vaginal vault excision very very difficult. You cannot excise the entire vaginal vault. So most often use is radiation. Vaginal sorbo is used in non irradiated patients, which appears more suitable as it is easily available and very effective also. So I think I will stop my talk here because already I have finished twenty minutes. Uh, I will uh, again uh, thank the chairpersons, Srinivas, sir, and uh, I will hand over the mic. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. You had another two three minutes. Uh, in fact, you could you could have continued also. Um, any uh, conclude conclusion or any few more slides remaining? Kindly continue, sir. It's okay, really okay, okay. Uh, then vaginal cancer as a rule, vaginal cancer uh, involving uh, any cancer involving cervix is labeled as cervical cancer. Suppose you have a cancer on the vagina extending to cervix. Sir. It is called as a cervical cancer. Similarly, any cancer involving the vulva is called as vulval cancer by rule. Vulvar cancer. The distinction is not very important because the management remains same. I think the slides are not moving anyway. <laughs> Come back to the slideshow, sir. Come back to the. Okay. Okay. Uh, are you able to see the slide now? Uh, the one which you, the one which you just spoke is there, sir. Uh, it's not moving forward. Not moving. It's not moving forward. Once again. Sir, you come out of the slide show. And okay. because sometimes if it is, and then you can move it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now we can see it now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Moving. Okay, now if you have figure staging of uh, uh, cancer, vagina, again you have four stages. Stage one is limited to vagina. Uh, one A is macroinvasive cancer, less than one, one mm uh, invasion into the stroma. And one B is more than one mm invasion into stroma, any size. Stage two, this is stage two here. You can see vagina is here. Stage two is involving the paracalpos. Stage three, when the tumor comes up to the vaginal, uh, up, to, up to the pelvic bone, stage three. And stage four is uh, spread to the bladder and vagina and distant spread. The lymphatic spread, upper vagina goes to pelvis, pelvic nodes, and the lower vagina goes to the inguinal nodes. Upper vagina goes to pelvic nodes, and lower vagina goes to the inguinal nodes. And uh, comparison, comparison with cervical cancer, vaginal cancer survival is inferior compared to cervical cancer because of difficulty in surgery. And not only difficulty in surgery, it is difficult to give adequate radiation because of close proximity to bladder and vagina, bladder and rectum. So the survival rates uh, in stage one, around 60 to 75%. In cervical cancer, it will be around 90%. Here it is 60 to 75%. So uh, the five-year survival rates are less as compared to cervical cancer. The management of upper one-third of vaginal cancer 
is same as cervical cancer. Upper one third, less than four centimeter, you can do radical hysterectomy along with removal of upper vagina. And uh, along with parametrium, you are removing paracalpus also. And you do pelvic node dissection. Okay. Uh, whenever you are doing surgery, you should do surgery so that post-operative radiotherapy is not required. That means patient should not have any, any evidence of pelvic nodes on MRI scan. So you do surgery only when the tumor is confined to the vagina. Don't do surgery when you have suspiciously enlarged pelvic lymph nodes. Okay, if surgery is not possible because of suspicious nodes or the tumor is more than 4 centimeter, then you can go for concomitant chemoradiation. For large tumors and for those with enlarged lymph nodes, concomitant chemoradiation is better, even in stage 1. Stage 1b to stage 4. Now, uh, radical for stage 1, lower one third of vagina, radical vulvectomy and lower vaginectomy can be done. If it is possible to obtain 1 centimeter tumor free margin. And along with the vulvectomy, you are also doing bilateral groin node dissection. Suppose you are not able to give adequate margins because the tumor is little big. Then you can give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, make the tumor shrink. Then you can do radical vulvectomy and lower vaginectomy. But sometimes, even after chemotherapy, it is not possible to shrink the tumor adequately. Then, then that case, better to go for chemoradiation. Chemoradiation along with groin node dissection later for all large tumors. So, all large tumors, stage one to stage four, better to go for chemoradiation. Surgery is done only for small tumors of lower one third of vagina. Middle vagina, vaginal cancer is rare. So in stage one, uh, limited to vagina, you can do surgical excision of vagina with wide margins. And post-operatively, patient will require radiotherapy up to four weeks. As it is difficult to remove the paracalpos due to proximity to the bladder and rectum. So even if you do surgery, you have to give radiotherapy because you cannot give good margins. You cannot remove the paracalpos. So radiotherapy is must. Again, more than stage one, go for concomitant chemoradiation. So in summary, except stage one, all vaginal cancers, uh, stage two, stage three, stage four, are managed by concurrent chemoradiation. Radiation is usually a combination of external beam radiotherapy and intracavitary cesium or intracavitary high, high dose rate radiotherapy. High dose rate radiotherapy is being used nowadays. Combination of external and internal radiotherapy. And patient also require concomitant chemotherapy. Concomitant chemotherapy. So chemo radiation is the treatment of choice for most of the vaginal cancers. Thank you so much. Again, I would like to thank uh, Narayan Swami. I'd like to thank Srinivas, I'd like to thank Padmini, Dr. Jyoti, and mm -hmm. all the BOSOG for inviting me for this particular talk. Thank you so much. Srinivas? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, as usual, uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, we have any, any kind of comments. We are really dumbstruck. And the rarest cancer, and you have given us... Uh, such a good insight to that. And one happy thing which I noticed here was the ease with which we can stage this cancer. CA cervix, CA endometrium, everything so complicated, but this is a very yeah, comfortably, yeah, yeah. you can stage this cancer, I feel. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box yet. Um, I think the organizer should tell us, should we proceed with the next session? Yes. And Dr. Narayan Swami has got to say anything, please. We have only compliments, no comments or <laughs> no questions. That's why they, they were all so self-explanatory and so informative. No, there is no room for any question for anybody. That's what I think. Thank you for that enlightening. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And on behalf of both of us, Dr. Narayan Swami and myself, I thank the BSOG for giving us this opportunity. And I take this as one of the greatest day of my life to chair a session in which my teacher is speaking and excellent. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Srinivas. Thank you, Narayan Swami.
Thank you, Dr. Padmini. Thank you, Jack Jyoti. Thank you so much. I think we can move on to the next. Jyoti, you are muted. Thank you, sir. Uh, let us quickly move on to the next session. Uh, session three this of this webinar, Vagina, Rever the Sacred Passage. I am uh, at, at the outset, I thank uh, Padmini Madam for this opportunity. And um, all her webinars have been conducted very systematically um, and we are speaking the unspoken. So much has been spoken about the past and the present of this topic. And we have so many uh, interesting um, uh, to uh, topics and speakers lined up for this uh, session on future of this webinar. And we have two eminent chairpersons, Dr. Sheila V. Mane, and Dr. Ananteshwar, sir, to chair this session. Uh, Dr. Sheila, madam, is uh, uh, doesn't need any introduction at all, and she's well known uh, to in our society and also for the federation. Uh, she, uh, she has been the past vice president of Foxy, and uh, she is at present working as a consultant. She has her own nursing home, Anugraha Nursing Home. She has. Uh, occupied so many posts at Foxy levels and even at the WHO and she has been the she is the governing council member of ICOG and she was our president of the Indian Menopausal Society Bangalore um, uh, branch and um, she is also the chairperson uh, for the Safe Motherhood Committee for the year 2008 to 2011 and she uh, and she had held the post of secretary for IMS between 2012 and 2014. And um, she is popularly known as the PPH teacher, PPH lady, who is, she's been going from state to state and she has done so many workshops on PPH. And moving on to Dr. Ananteshwar, uh, sir, he, he is a plastic surgeon, has done fellowships in craniofacial surgery, reconstructive microvascular surgery, hand surgery. His experience is really noteworthy. He is, he is a senior consultant and HOD at Manipal Hospital, Bengaluru, and is an urgent professor in plastic surgery in the Manipal University, certified DNP teacher for plastic surgery, international faculty of craniomaxillary facial surgery, and affiliated to Switzerland, short service commissioned officer as captain in army medical corps of the Indian army between 83 and 89. He's an editor of the International Journal of Plastic Surgery and Transplantation, editorial member of International Journal of Craniomaxial Facial Trauma and Reconstruction. And he has several publications to his credit and uh, so I request the chairpersons to take over the session and introduce the speakers. And before I give it to the chairpersons, I would like to inform that Dr. Shobha Gudi has been, uh, uh, she has expressed her apology. At present, she is unable to uh, take over and do um, and speak for the first session. We will see at the end of the session whether she's available or not. She's held up for some. Yeah, reasons. thank you, Dr. Jyoti. Yes, yeah, yes. for that kind introduction. Uh, uh, can I introduce the first speaker? So yes, that Because uh, yes, I have ICOG PG clinics, uh, so many yes. programs, if you don't mind. Yes, madam, you have to introduce our own beloved president, Padmini Prasad, who will be speaking on oh, vaginal my pleasure. Touch me not. Yes, madam. Yeah. Because uh, Dr. Sh uh, Shobha Gudi is uh, not there at present. That is fine. Mm. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. So all of us, we know that uh, how vibrant is Dr. Padmini's uh, year and, uh, and all of us uh, really uh, busy this year attending so many webinars and learning so much. And uh, as uh, we know that uh, uh, her theme is different, you know, and uh, we have really uh, have a good insight into now the other aspects. For her credentials, she is the first qualified woman sexologist from Karnataka 
she's a medical director of ramamani nursing home and maternity home and uh, uh, currently she is the president of bsog chairperson of sexual medicine and std committee kasoga she is a member of world association for sexual health and she is a committee member of sexuality education internal uh, international society for uh, sexual medicine secretary council of uh, sex education and uh, parenthood international uh, federation and national coordinator of sexual medicine uh, committee of foxy and she has she is a co-opted member of family planning association of india and i must tell you that being so senior also she is uh, really i mean goes there to fpi and evening clinics and she is really uh, i mean uh, right really i mean she has so much of passion for this and she is there to help the society on many aspects as well as the sex education she has a golden lamp award silver lamp award from uh, Uh, CSCPL. Then she is author of uh, many books, and she has uh, participated as orator, and she has given multiple talks in the national and international conferences. And she is regularly featured on televisions and radio regarding sexual and reproductive health awareness program. So we, uh, I welcome you, Dr. Padmini, uh, for your talk. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shila, for the exhaustive and kind introduction. Uh, one minute, I'll share the. ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಟು ಯು ಆಲ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿ ಔಟ್ಸೈಟ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ದಿ ಚೇರ್ಪರ್ಸನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ಅಟೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಎನ್ಕರೇಜಿಂಗ್ ಬಿ ಎಸ್ ಓ ಜಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿಥೌಟ್ ವೇಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಮಚ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದ ಮೈ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ವಜೈನಲ್ ಬ್ಲಿಂಕ್ ಟಚ್ ಮೀ ನಾಟ್ ದಿ ವಜೈನಿಸ್ಮಸ್ ವೈ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕೆಪ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೈಟಲ್ ವಜೈನಲ್ ಬ್ಲಿಂಕ್ and touch me not so this is a very common sexual problem gynecological problem with lot of bearing on infertility and relationships so every gynecologist must know something about vaginismus how to diagnose and how to treat some of the difficult cases of vaginismus may be difficult to treat but at least they should be able to recognize vaginismus which can cause various problems and leading to problem with health harmony and happiness of the woman and also the couple so only two or three examples i'll give you how they can present <laughs> recently i had on 15 people coming to my consultation chamber few from the girl side and few from the boy side they were all so angry the girl side they came inside and told me recently my daughter got married we had spent so much money we had we were uh, we were loving her so much and now she is coming and telling me telling us that the husband is impotent so then i made them sit outside i just took history separately and together the couple and slowly when i did an examination it was detected to be a case of vaginismus but because of the vaginismus the husband had developed secondary erectile dysfunction he was unable to perform after a few attempts he felt that he is he himself has got the problem and he so he just kept quiet and the wife made a big galata telling that the husband is impotent so this is a case of vaginismus how a female problem can be presented by the male problem if both of them are not seen together this problem can be missed because usually the husband man goes to some uh, male doctor surgeon or urologist and the wife goes to gynecologist and then the problem starts another case presented to me they are not uh, after 8 years of marriage unable to conceive they came to me because of the social pressure of having the child so they were sent by the family people for an examination why she is not conceiving so after the examination it was found out that it was a non consummated marriage that's why 
they were not able to have proper intercourse and they had not gone for any examination for the infertility that was the first time they had come so i have seen a non consummated marriage of varying from few months to few years and the longest period duration was uh, 42 years when that time when the man came and told that all these here years we were not having any intercourse and this was the problem so it is a very common problem even so many cases have been referred to me from family courts of disturbed interpersonal relationship where they had applied for divorce so after the examination you could find out that this was the reason and why it led to disturbed interpersonal relationship ultimately leading to divorce and so many cases they have taken back the case and they are the happy couple having a child now and another case another lady came to me for a non consummated marriage husband brought to brought her he was a very nice uh, gentleman very loving and caring and when i asked the girl why you are not cooperating with your husband and it's a case of vaginism then she told me in one word all men are dogs she as a child she was sexually abused repeatedly by her own father and uncle and she could never tell this to anybody and with the by force or some family person who was uh, known to her so she could get married to him she was loving him but still she was so scared about the sexual relationship and about the men she had the, such a bad opinion about all men so these are the various ways by which the vaginism can be presented to the doctor so <laughs> vaginism so in 1547 treatise on the diseases of women protula of salenro is thought to have provided the earliest description of what we today call vaginism a tightening of the vulva so that even a woman who has been seduced may appear a virgin much later huer gave the first medical description of the syndrome however it appears that sims first coined the term vaginism in 1862 while addressing the obstetrical society of london sims described vaginism as an involuntary spasmodic closure of the mouth of the vagina attended with such excessive super sensitiveness as to form a complete barrier to coition to date the involuntary muscle spasm remains the core element of the definition of vaginism suggested by the american college of obstetrics gynecology and also by the dsm4 classification the international classification of diseases icd10 categorizes vaginism either as a pain disorder or as a sexual dysfunction comprised of a spasm of the pelvic floor muscles that surround the vagina causing the occlusion of the vaginal opening with penile entry being either impossible or painful so the current definition includes the vaginism is currently classified as genito pelvic pain penetration disorder in the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders so dsm5 defines vaginism as a recurrent or persistent involuntary spasm of the musculature of the outer third of the vagina that interferes with sexual intercourse usually the classified if the by if the problem persists for a duration of at least 6 months so this dsm5 classifies female sexual dysfunction into sexual interest arousal disorder now it is combined both interest and arousal disorder orgasmic disorder and sexual pain disorder so these are the so epidemiology if take the incidence worldwide the incidence of vaginism is thought to be about 1 to 7% with considering that disorder is cross cultural in clinical settings the incident may be as high as 5 to 17% but many of them may not come to light so the challenges faced in these sexual disorders it is not reported even when they are widely prevalent 64% women can't talk regarding the partner regarding this to the partner also 82% of the patients had some sort of sexual problem only 18% patient said that they have no sexual problem and none of them consulted or took any form of assistance from any medical personnel so the how they perceive the perception in the clinics various clinics if you take the youth when you ask various questions why you did not seek treatment of the sexual problems 
was shy of talking to anybody, thought this happens to everyone, did not know there is a treatment possible, had no issues with the sexual problem being present. So they just live with the problem. If you take the classification of vaginismus as usual, primary, where she has never experienced normal intercourse, secondary, where the vaginismus has developed after a period of normal intercourse, global or situation, where it can be present during only at some situations or with some partner or if it is present all the time. So it can be mild with little discomfort and burning. It can be moderate with pain and severe discomfort. It can be severe where coitus and per vaginal examination will be impossible. So various grades have been described. If you take grade one or first degree, patient has spasm of the pelvic floor that can be relieved by reassurance. And in second degree spasm is present but maintained throughout the pelvic exam even with reassurance. Patient elevates the buttocks to avoid being examined in third degree. And in fourth degree, it is a more severe form of vaginismus. The patient elevates the buttocks, retreats, and tightly closes the thighs to avoid examination. I have seen, even if you just go near the patient, she just gets the clonic contraction of the muscles, even the thigh muscles, she starts shivering. So that's how the PASI classified the fifth degree in which patient experiences sweating, palpitation, hyperventilation, shaking, nausea, vomiting, giddiness. She may jump off the table or she may even attack the doctor. So that is how the various severity can be described. So vaginismus is a conditioned response and provoking stimulus can be previous experience of pain, fantasy of pain and fear of penetration. Most of the time vaginismus is caused by bad advices from friends and relatives and the common myth that first intercourse will cause pain and bleeding. This is one thing I always tell uh, their people when they come, when they're newly married, when they're going to get married, don't give any advices which are scary. So it will be so painful. You have to tolerate, you have to cooperate with the husband and whatever the husband does, you have to do. So these are the advices given to the girls and they start and looking in the reading somewhere in the media and doing in the media. So they develop some deep seated phobia. So many girls, some of the girls cannot come out of this phobia. And what I have seen, this is the major cause for the vaginismus, which were in non-consummated marriages. So in this condition, she has got perfectly normal desire, but she is unable to cooperate. This is an involuntary thing, not that she is doing it purposefully or uh, knowingly or voluntarily. So libido is unaffected. They can experience the other types of stimulations where they can get excited. With the vaginismus, the mind and body develop a conditioned response against penetration. The body has learned to expect or anticipate pain upon penetration so that the powerful PC muscle flinches or contracts to protect against the potential of intercourse pain. So this can be equated to blinking of one size and wincing when an object is hurled towards the person. It is not something a woman thinks about doing it it just happens. So it is not intentional or voluntary. Because when I was a student, I had seen some patient, I still remember when they were not cooperating for a PB examination, they were just beaten or scolded and then they were sent away telling that you are not cooperative and why are you behaving like this? And those days we had not known that there is a condition like vaginismus. And so that is how some of the girls are unable to cooperate for pelvic examination. That's why I call this a blink, vaginal blink, where it is, touch me not even, don't go close to her, the vagina also, she can develop problem. So although the condition can be upsetting, embarrassing and stressful, it is absolutely treatable. It is common cause of ongoing sexual pain and is also the primary cause of non-consummated marriage. So there are various reasons why it can develop, the psychogenic factors or organic factors, so anything that causes pain or the dyspareunia can cause vaginismus. Myth about pain and bleeding during first sexual encounter. And because of so many customs in the society, the white bed sheet custom, then they give a white bed sheet to the girl to take it in the first nuptial night. And they have to show bleeding or blood spots on that. Otherwise, the uh, girl is thought to be not a virgin. So these are all pressurization by the society and giving so much of importance to the hymen bleeding 
and virginity. So all these problems can be there for the girl. So anxiety, guilt, fear of pregnancy, fear of STD, fear of intimacy, loss of control. Even if there is fear of pregnancy where the husband is not allowing the wife to use uh, contraceptives and fear of infection. I have got so many uh, women who come and say, my husband got so many contact with so many women, I'm scared to have intercourse with him. So she is uh, unable to cooperate with the husband. So even the discovery and punishment, fear of vagina being small or penis being too large, self-consciousness about body image, religious orthodox. And one lady who came, she was uh, suffering from PCOD, put on a lot of weight and uh, with a uh, lot of uh, problems and hirsutism, she was saying she had developed such severe body image problem and say, no, I feel so scared. I feel ashamed to cooperate with my husband. I cannot be nude in front of him. So I cannot cooperate for intercourse. So the body image problem itself can lead to uh, the problem and various types of sexual trauma, rape, incest, child sex abuse, and hostile relationship, lack of understanding, and faulty position. So, there, these are all the various things where the studies have been conducted about the misinformation, ignorance, and guilt about sexuality, fear of pain. Organic pathology has to be diagnosed, like hymenal abnormalities, congenital abnormalities, radiation, cancers prolapsed uterus, vulvar vestibulitis, endometriosis, and so on, and the sexual violation, which I described, and some of the cases where is the religious orthodoxy. And even today, I get many ladies uh, who come with, they are very orthodox in their house, and where sex is thought to be talking anything about it is thought to be a sin and against uh, religion. And so they also develop negative factors or negativity about the sexual relationship itself, and some of the personality disorders which can happen in these uh, ladies. Uh, so the parents' relationship and the father-daughter relationship. If she has seen a father who is alcoholic, drunkard, and uh, is suffering from mental disorders, and where he is all the time not treating the mother well, she develops some sort of phobias against the men and also the marriage. So this is another reason. And the male partner's personality and sexual dysfunction. That can also indirectly cause problem to uh, the wife. So the presentation and symptoms of vaginismus, as per this uh, uh, various explanations I told you, as per degree of vaginismus, there can be minor discomfort, burning, or involuntary tightness, or significant pain during the intercourse, all this history. So repeated excuses for TV examination. Each time she comes, she tells, I have not washed myself, I have not cleaned, I have not shaved. I will come next time, I have got periods. So these are some repeated excuses. We think it is a genuine excuse, but for her, she is having an escapist attitude. Difficulty at examination, refusal to unrope, repeated excuses for coitus, and main thing about non-consummation, infertility, and I gave example of how male sexual in, uh, dysfunction can occur because of this, and ultimately it can lead to disturbed relationship and divorce. So what are the impact of vaginismus? The main thing, marital disharmony, relationship problem, faulty sexual intercourse and other various disorders. So the other thing is about the lack of knowledge, confusion about sexual act, negative attitude and fear of all this and the husband. Husband will be describing, I feel as though I'm hitting a wall because it is closed so tight and it is hard. He feels that he is hitting a wall. And on examination, Refusal for PE examination, closing of thighs, spasm of adductor muscles of thighs, arching of the back, squeezing of vaginal muscles, and jumping of the tab uh, table. So assessment, examination of the external genitalia to exclude any organic pathology is mandatory. Gentle pelvic examination. I have got quite a few who are suffering from uh, uh, vaginismus where they come and tell and with so much difficulty, husband ha has uh, had brought those uh, ladies to me for examination and she just refused and she said, no, I have been to uh, the another uh, few doctors where there was uh, some, uh, they did an examination. It was so painful. I just do not want to go for any pelvic examination anymore. That's why I have not visited any doctor. So this is another way they present. So the examination of women with vaginismus prematurely or before she is ready may cause extreme pain and exacerbation of their problem. So women's attitude to her own genitals 
and whether or not she can see or examine or tolerate touching herself is also important. They just, they don't even wash it properly during the bath and they don't like to touch the vagina. So this is some of the extreme cases you can have these problems. So various different sexual pain conditions, if you describe the dyspareunia, vaginismus, or vestibulodynia, or vulvodynia. These are all other causes of severe pain. So you have to rule out before diagnosing vaginismus. So these are the simple chart, how it can avoidance of intercourse and gynec exam, relationship background, fear of vaginal penetration, involuntary muscle spasm, pain, humility, anxiety, distress, infertility, all these things. So three things there are fear, pain, and spasm. These are the main three condi uh, conditions which are associated with vaginismus. So these are the three components, fear, pain, muscle spasm. Pain can be a cause or consequence of vaginal muscle spasm. So if we come to the treatment, there is a controversy over the treatment of choice for vaginismus. Vaginismus as a phobic reaction to an excessive fear of pain was one of the first to recommend psychotherapy. In 1970s, Masters and Johnson greatly influenced the treatment of sexual dysfunction and reported that vaginismus could be easily treated with behaviorally oriented sex therapy, which included vaginal dilatation. He was the one who said it is 100% treatable and Masters and Johnson, they said it is 100% treatable by altering their behavior, allowing them to explore their own body through sensate focus exercises and slowly desensitizing them and using the dilatation, vaginal dilatation, and the finger is the best dilator and the, the wife's finger or the husband's finger or the commercially available dilators. So this are a combination of therapy is the one which can give rise to proper treatment. The current treatments which are available are into four main categories, pelvic floor physiotherapy, pharmacological treatments, general psychotherapy, and sex therapy or cognitive behavior therapy. So the pelvic floor physiotherapy, it is the one which creates awareness and control of the vaginal musculature. Physical therapy such as breathing and relaxation, local tissue desensitization, vaginal dilators, pelvic floor biofeedback and manual therapy techniques. So this is what uh, Masters and Johnson described. What I do is that main thing which I have seen in the maximum cases or uh, the treatment, just tell them about the proper sexual intercourse and why it is there, why they can cooperate, how they can go about it. Let them explore their bodies and do all the sexual activities except penetration or except intercourse. So that, that fear of penetration should be taken away from her mind so that she is able to relax herself. She will learn how she can relax and enjoy the body sensations and how she can be aroused sexually. Later, allow her to touch her own genitalia. And once she becomes comfortable, then ask her to put one finger inside the vagina and keep it for five to 10 minutes, at least two to three times in a day and do the Kegels exercises where she can understand when she is contracting the muscles, when she is relaxing the muscles. With the combination of these three, I have seen there is no need for any uh, extraordinary treatments or extraordinary methods or the costly treatments. And most of them will get desensitized with this when you, if, you, if you call them every week. And only few cases, one or two cases, I have taken one year to treat them, but most of them will get corrected within one to two months. So the pharmacological treatment, if some of them are available, they like local anesthetics, 5% lidocaine gel to the areas of the vaginal intraitis. It is thought to reduce the pain, but what I say, I'm against using any local anesthetics for any of the sexual dysfunction because she has to learn to understand the uh, sensations and those sensations should not be taken away so I am against using any of these local anesthetic the agents or the ointments. The muscle relaxants like nitroglycerin ointment and botulinum toxin, where the, our next speaker is going to talk more about it. She has got with a personal experience that Ragini Agarwal will be speaking on that. So this is supposed to relax the vaginal uh, muscles. It is a temporary muscle paralytic. It has been recommended in the treatment of vaginismus with the aim of decreasing the hypertonicity of pelvic floor muscles. 
and anxiolytic medication, diazepam can be given. The psychotherapy, usually there is a psychological component. The brain perceives penetration as a threat and sends the message to PC muscles to keep out of danger. So hence, counseling and therapy are part of the treatment programs for vaginismus. General psychotherapy is described and the marital relation, relationship problems, and also some of the negative attitude which they have developed should be resolved so that they can have a positive attitude towards the sexual relationship. So it can be a combination of exercises, education, and therapy. Despite a high success rate of treatments, Many women live with vaginismus for years out of guilt, shame, or embarrassment. Women should visit a doctor immediately if sex is painful or penetration is found impossible. So primary vaginismus begins at the point of sexual maturity, continuing throughout the lifespan of the patient until successfully treated. So secondary vaginismus can be an event that affects uh, vagina. It can be labor, difficult labor, rape, or menopause. So you also have to keep in mind how a difficult labor and so much of problem and the genital problem, tears, stitches, pains can give rise to vaginismus. So this is also one condition which they have to. And vaginal examination is a crucial part of therapy. It provides an opportunity to diagnose and explain the condition. It helps in desensitization, teaching relaxation exercises, relaxation of abdominal thigh muscles and vaginal muscles with self-exploration, which forms a part of treatment. And there's something about vaginal dilators. And you can also, these various dilators are available in the market, starting from a smaller size to big size, and slowly increase the sizes till she becomes comfortable. And what I say, if they don't get any dilators, the various candles of varying stages, so the sizes of the candles can be covered with the condom and the lubricant and that itself can be used as the dilator. And once she is able to do it, she can even take the help of the partner. So partner should be cooperative and you have to counsel the couple together so that partner also participates and she starts to become more and more uh, comfortable. So the sensate focus which I showed you, that is uh, the, how the body is touched and explored with various uh, um, uh, stimulations of the body for the arousal. And slowly she can start at the end when she becomes comfortable with her body and able to insert two fingers, she can start the on woman and top position or missionary position where she herself can take control for the penetration. Surgery is used to treat physical problems like tight hymen, scars, etc. Desensitization and behavior therapy should be continued. Hymenectomy for vaginismus is not at all advised. I have seen many cases of uh, vaginismus who have undergone hymen hymenectomy. So I tell them you that the door is small or big. If you are closing it, it is the effect is same. So the use of surgical procedures in the absence of obvious abnormality is useless, unnecessary, and constitutes another form of assault. So the treatment sessions can take three to four sessions or even eight to ten sessions, and some it can be prolonged. So the, you had to teaching about physical exercises is important. And so the more severe forms may be difficult to treat, but slowly with all types of multiple things, it can be treated and the dilators which are available. And electromyography, and these are all biofeedback to show her which muscle she is contracting, which muscle she is relaxing using electrodes. And this can be a method of treatment. Psychotherapy and cognitive behavior therapy where the irrational thoughts and behaviors can be changed so that she can understand and be comfortable with her treatment. And hypnotherapy is another form of treatment where some people are using. This I will not go into detail. Botulinum toxin A, you are going to hear about it. So management overview, multidimensional, multidisciplinary approach is recommended. Treatment should be individualized. Psychological issues and interpersonal issues should be first addressed with psychotherapy. Therapy is tailored to the needs of the woman and her partner. Patient choice of gender of physician and therapist should also be considered. So involvement of the partner in the treatment is important. Education to correct any misinformation is very useful. And treatment is to enable the woman to become more comfortable with genitals, followed by graded exposure to different types of vaginal penetration, 
to overcome her fear of penetration. Okay. So the high level of anxiety, I'm just closing in one or two seconds. So high level of anxiety, fear, resistant to genital examination, all these things can be treated. So this I explained to you, systematic uh, vaginal desensitization. These are all uh, the various steps of the systematic desensitization. So this recently we heard about the Semcella chairs, which, which can improve the pelvic floor muscles by Kegels, uh, artificially doing the Kegels exercises. That's why I just put it. So in conclusion, Vaginismus as one of the common sexual dysfunction has a significant impact on the impeccability of couples' relationships. Stratifying the severity of vaginismus has been found to be of value in helping to determine the best course of treatment. Attempt to find out that vaginismus is primary or secondary would be helpful in proper treatment of these patients. Recent studies demonstrate that pharmacologic therapies such as botulinum toxin have a significant benefit, which could be useful in mild to severe cases of vaginismus. Combination of pharmacological treatment and physical treatment, such as dilatation, demonstrate to have a great result in comparison with the single method of treatment. There is still running research on treatment of vaginismus with higher rate of success without any chance of recurrence. So this is what it is, and you the vag uh, vaginal blink, touch me not, so that she should become comfortable for the touch. Thank you very much for the patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padmini, uh, for that uh, lucid presentation. I think uh, many points to learn because most of the time the people don't know whom to approach and where to approach. So I think uh, it is very important. And uh, thank you very much for that uh, nice deliberation. Are we taking the questions now or at the end? At the end of the session, I think. Better. We can finish the talks. Questions at the end? Yes, after the end of the session. We can. Okay, okay. So thank you for your uh, lucid presentation. Thank you. And if, uh, please excuse me, as I have to join a PG class. Of ICOG. Okay. Bye, Sheila. Hi. Hi, Ragini. <laughs> I have to join that ICOG PG yeah. class. Okay. Okay. Nice to see. And your background is very nice, very pleasant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you. So I think we can move on to next yeah. talk. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes. I think Dr. Sheila is, uh, has to go for some class. Thank you, Dr. Padmini. It was a beautiful lecture. Very nice. Now, I request uh, Dr. Ragini Agarwal uh, to uh, start the uh, next lecture on Botex therapy. Is it concerned with the vaginismus? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think um, it is in continuation with the um, uh, vaginismus uh, uh, management. So uh, she is the uh, vice president of uh, Foxy 2020. She is the clinical director of uh, Gynae and Mass and head of the department of cosmetic gynecology at uh, Pratiksha Hospital, Gurkham. The list keeps on going on and on. I think it thank will you, be too so much for me to. Yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you, sir. You thank you so much. <laughs> Ragini, please go ahead yeah. with the lecture. Thank you, sir. We are waiting thank to you. see your lecture. Thank you. <sighs> so, very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you, Dr. Padmini, for giving me this opportunity. I'm a, your great admirer for so many years. Uh, it's really a proud privilege to share dais with you. And uh, speaking after you is a, literally a courage for me. Uh, you are a pioneer. Uh, I'll just share my screen and I am uh, not going to repeat anything what Dr. Padmini has already discussed. So I kept my talk from the starting from the treatment. The, as Madam has said, it's very, very clear. These women, when they come to you, the first your aim is to break the vicious cycle. 
and replacing pain by pleasure, spas by relaxation, and made the woman feel that she owns her body, her vagina, and can share it for sexual activity should she wishes. So these with this aim, when you take those patients, the biggest thing is that you have to be very patient. You have time for them. You will be empathetic, not over sympathetic, although your attitude should come across as sympathetic, warm, welcoming. So the, my first thing, when these patients come to you, you cannot just write a prescription like anything else. Yes, patient has come by the PID, you have written an antibiotic. Here, Reaching to a treatment, Botox is not a treatment directly, the topic which has been given to me. Before that, there are many steps. So they need time. In your busy OPD, if you don't have time to give them, talk to them and book a counseling, detailed counseling session with them and call them for that detailed counseling session. A detailed history is very important before you jump with any type of a pharmacological treatment. The number one thing is uh, detailed history to understand whether it is primary, secondary, global, or anything as Madam has said, it is very, very important. And the second thing is in the most of the patient, what I have come across, history of sexual trauma is very common. And as Dr. Padmani has told in the first instance, the mostly they are the their own real close relatives. And it puts such a block in their mind. If you, if you go give them the Botox injection, uh, they feel like being raped on a marital bed. So and the multidisciplinary act, uh, approach start from the start is very, very necessary. And if you're not attuned to give a proper sexual therapy, involve a sexual therapist or psychiatrist or psychotherapist with yourself and who are less anxious, vaginal trainer can be used. So phobia, sex education and control of muscles. Uh, biofeedback is a very nice thing to offer them with the help of a pelvic physiotherapist. If they are a very mild type businessmas, but a businessmas which is really severe or grade three, grade four, here you have to first break that cycle and start stepwise one by one. So systemic vaginal desensitization is very necessary. Then you will go for the botulinum toxin. And with the botulinum toxin, what we have found, it's a uh, almost uh, 80 to 90% success rate. If we have evaluated patient properly, she does not have some block inside and she is continuing with our post-operative advices and all the psychotherapy sessions. So muscles surrounding her intritus. Here, one thing I can tell you that education is must. You have to educate that patient about the anatomy also. And whenever we take in confidence couple, your treatment is going to have more success. Only 20 to 30% patient who are really in a grade five and have a very, very long deep seated trauma is not going to, or they are in an abusive marriage. They are not happy with this partner or something. That is another thing. Otherwise, they all respond to your uh, even first line and the second line of the treatment. So, uh, Kegel exercise, Madam has already told, designer trainer is no doubt is a wonderful thing, but it is always better to advise them uh, after a few sessions of the trainer, the husband can use the finger. And if uh, she allows to use the finger, your success rate is going to be very, very early. So coming to directly to my topic, Botox. What is Botox? It is uh, produced by the Clostridium botulinum. 
Mechanism is prevention of acetylcholine release, prevents muscular transmission, muscle weakness, temporary muscle paralysis. We all know this thing. And we use Botox for many, many purposes and specifically today for the facial aesthetics, it is in a vogue. And many medical conditions is also being treated by the Botox. After giving an injection, the treatment effect start after three to seven days of the injections and it lasts about three to four months. But mind it that this particular indication in the business must is still not licensed. And whenever you do anything which is off license, off level, it's today's medical legal hostile word. It is necessary to talk it about with the patient, tell them and make them a party, document it, take a consent only and whatever the problem you can think of, always tell them this, this, this side effect may happen because it is an off-level thing. Patient if patient is fully informed, it was documented and give her time to think also. Don't do the procedure on the same day. If you're taking a consent today, tell her go back, come another day. So she cannot say that I was not, I was not coerced. She has taken enough time to decide. So uh, if we see there's other condition which are uh, allowed to go with the stasis, frontal headache, blepharous spas, cervical dystonia, these are the condition which is allowed. So this is the tray. Here, there is a saline solution to mix with the Botox powder. This is the Botox powder from manufacturer. And these are the syringes where Botox powder is mixes with the saline and draws into these syringes. How we will constitute and the handle? He while refrigerator, not in the fr uh, freezer. It will be kept in the freeze. We constitute with 0.9% non-preserved NACL. Use 22 gauze, one inch or one quarter inch long needle with the three to five ml syringes. Insert the needle straight into the vial, then tilt the vial at 45 degree angle. Slowly inject the saline into the vial. Vacuum demonstrate that the sterility of the vial is intact. Gently mix the toxin with the saline by moving vials side to side or rotating the vial. Usually we make 2.5 ml in 100 unit. That's why we are using those needles, uh, these um, insulin syringe type of uh, uh, syringe. So we can give you a 0 0.1, 0 0.1 uh, ml also. Draw the fluid into the injection syringe by placing the needle into the bottom corner of the vial for full extraction and syringes are stored in a refrigerator. The uh, 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, never below 0 degree. Can be stored for four to six weeks, but we try <clears throat> to finish it off early because potency decreases as it was delayed in using. It should be clear, colorless, and free of the particulate material. So the, if you see this diagram, the one thing I can say when we talk about the sexual medicine or aesthetic kinetic medicine, it is very important to go again to your anatomy books, read detail about the pelvic diaphragm, pelvic membrane, pelvis, and the most important thing is to understand the vulva because it is an absolutely neglected organ in our gynec. We really directly go to the per speculum examination, per vaginal examination, very few of us see the vagina, the vulva. And many times we miss also the vulval problem. They are always talk about the vulvo vaginal problem. And the second thing is the whole anatomy of the pelvic muscles, nerves and vasculature should be in your mind. There should be a picture. So whenever you do a per vaginal examination of any patient for anything, always try to palpate the muscles 
and make a picture in your mind how the vaginal wall appears normal vaginal wall appears in your finger so we usually use 100 ml 100 unit of the bottle intoxide in normally although it was written 50 to 130 in the literature but in my practice i use 100 unit divided into 50 50 on each side of the vagina there it was given at the three points and uh, it's better patient should be sedated because you cannot work on those patient but don't give a general anesthesia which can relax the muscle and when you put the finger inside you can feel a hard band like a structure and after giving the injection in the exact location of the muscle you can patient can be discharged and you can call the patient after one week to check the vaginal muscle res uh, resistance and meantime that one week patient should have a psychotherapy also and you will give her a vaginal trainer also to do to work by herself it is injected into the vaginal side walls in vaginismus patient and the most important two structure which are going there urethra and rectum they should be avoided to prevent incontinence it can be injected into one or combination or all of the three vaginal muscles which are responsible for the patient's uncontrollable vaginal spasms but i usually prefer to give in the pubo coccygeal muscle group sometime i don't go to other muscles also if uh, it is not very uh, severe category uh, as part of the pelvic floor muscle they are the bigger muscle and you can feel like a tightly drawn fist in the most severe vaginismus so just see this diagram it is from net it, uh, very beautifully they have uh, make uh, made it clear how to go inside the vaginal um, uh, wall but mind it again we as a gynecologist it is a very easy uh, thing to do for for all of us but these patients are not only for prescription they need beyond this prescription all those talking therapy and confidence in themselves and in their partner also single treatment is usually sufficient once the vagina is progressively stressed and the patient can experience pain free penetration second round of injection is rarely necessary once the vagina remains relaxed dilated for 12 months the affected vaginal muscles are less likely to resume their spastic nature once the patient achieves pain free penetration and intercourse with dilators the neural response that previously triggered vaginal spasms fear anxiety upon penetration gradually shut down so we has very clear indications severe or refractory cases of the vaginismus contraindication no doubt if it is hypersensitivity or pregnancy in local infection or any other neuromuscular disease or coagulopathy you will refrain to give this treatment usually there is no side effect but even in the best hand sometime you can experience fecal and urinary incontinence we had in one patient in the mild urinary incontinence uh so it is very important to tell them about this and documented this complication specifically uh effect is good success is there so this is a specific program by mr pasic i don't use it must in this way because i don't use bpavacan injection but other thing is always there after toxin you have to give the progressive dilatation post treatment counseling and the support is very very important sometime what happened when you examine this patient and what you find that there is no hymen because at the first time they tried to do the intercourse but it is very very difficult and painful so mind it it is not maybe businessmas it is something else in three of my patient there is a very tight hymenal ring it is very difficult even for me to introduce my finger so in those cases they really required a cutting 
otherwise hymenectomy as madam has said is no role so when the patient is wake up with a large dilator in a face patient achieve early pain free dilatation in the recovery area and then she was discharged with the dilator and she may to use this dilation at her own comfortable way and it is very very effective than waiting for the 2 to 7 days for botox to become effective before initiating the dilatation so this is the uh, post procedure counseling it is very important to tell her the positions about the position and madam has said the top up position missionary position a spoon position because uh, these thing sex education plays a very big role single penetration by herself prior to dilatation importance of keeping a dilatation diary as we do the Uh, bladder diary menstrual diary because this will keep patient accountable for her dilation as well as the keeping the clinician informed and it will give her a, a confidence also use of other aids like vibrators to overcome the clinical aspect of the dilating lubricants can be used sensate focus exercise and uh, not only the male education is also required many time they are so insensitive they don't know even that the four play is important and uh, gradually they these women become responsive so actually this sex education should start from the adolescent only in our country transition from the dilators to intercourse there should be some setting no time limit to attempt the intercourse because it is a treatment it is not something which has to be done in the hasty way and my husband has to be taught the first time is not going to have a complete intercourse it should be a very very minimal penetration and all the time he has to be made the confidence it is always better the top up position so uh, catch up emotionally to where i am physically so the, this bonding is also very very necessary and management of the low libido and orgasmia relationship problem maybe she require little bit uh, medication also like viagra and all management of the erectile dysfunction overcoming fears of the dreaded gynecological examination this one thing i really want to tell all the gynecologists be very very patient when you are doing any gynecological examination or any one and in the very very respectful doing the child birth menopause is a period when because of the loss of estrogen uh, hyperestro hypoestrogenic condition the vagin uh, vaginal epithelium become parch like and at this time it is really very difficult to have sex or a examination here the treatment of the dryness is very important so biofeedback i love it physiotherapy is a wonderful thing not only for this thing any uh, pelvic floor disorder pelvic physiotherapy should be the first line with the biofeedback uh hymenectomy as uh, madam has also told and uh, uh it's not a problem it is not going to solve the problem topical anesthetics antidepressant uh we have to see whether she is on something else also and never never ever uh, give anything to sedate and have a sex this is most negative thing to be done and uh, i never go for this uh, treatment it is better to go with the botox and it is better to give them the dilator of the botox giving them lots of so many antidepressant and these things sex education is the primary thing and the every couple should have a premarital sexual counseling and the guidance so to conclude businessmas vestibulodynia and dyspareunia overlap so here as a gynecologist we have to rule out the causes of dyspareunia also one of my case i remember they came from the middle east and uh, husband was uh, really very put off we all know that it was she was a second wife uh, their uh, sexual life of those males are really very active when i try to uh, do a pv examination she literally jumped up from the table and 
if i was not dug down she was really smashed her uh, leg on my face but do you know she is never she is not having vestibular dynia she was not having resinismus what she was having is a ochivira syndrome have hemi vagina with a there is a big area of the collected blood and uh, that's why it was so painful when i touched it she really winced and after that we uh, operation we did the release the make the full vagina release the collected blood and everything and then they have a happy life so as a gynecologist we have to think always everything not every woman having a business must not every woman is having a vestibular dynia maybe something else sometime women uh, male they they do the penetration in such a way there's a tear of the forehead and every time when they have a sex and the uh, forehead get teared so they also ultimately it uh, lead to a secondary business must vaginal muscle spasm is not a valid or reliable diagnostic criteria so clinical syndrome that consists of overlapping uh, elements of the hypertonic pelvic floor muscles pain anxiety and difficulty in penetration uh control of muscles sex education they are very important so thank you so much for your patient hearing and thank you padmini madam for giving me this opportunity to share my views thank you so much thank you very much that was a very beautiful presentation and very well in a nutshell telling everything about this vaginismus chair person hello shall we call the next uh, person into the going to be dr praveen matre uh, we will be talking on uh, 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 neo vagina so he is a uh, Uh, professor at uh, uh, km hospital and um, uh, he has world's first ovarian <laughs> plant in 2002 he is a very very renowned person i am also from bombay so i know him very well <laughs> the other way around so i welcome you sir please come and then you will be talking about the new neo vagina uh, thank you very much looking forward to your lecture can i share am i audible yes uh, can i share my screen please yes yeah am i audible now hello yes sir you are audible yes, yes you are right yeah. okay not. okay i'll be speaking on novel vaginoplasty but your screen is not shared uh but that's what i'm asking you to share my screen please but in share screen is it there now yes okay fine thank you very much and sorry for the delay uh today i'll be speaking on my technique of novel vaginoplasty which results into normal vagina <clears throat> this is a laparoscopic peritoneal vaginoplasty what we have developed which results into a normal vaginal formation we have also identified how this normal vagina is formed by identifying the progenitor cell and finally our research has culminated in genetic decoding of mrk syndrome almost 1 in 4000 girls are born with absent vagina or mrk syndrome there are three types which we have identified <clears throat> type 1 which is a pure or uh, mrk syndrome type 2 where there is a renal cardiac and skeletal anomalies and type 3 which is a little unknown entity is the mrk syndrome with hyperandrogenism and almost 30% of our cases were from mrk with hyperandrogenism syndrome almost 300 years ago in 1830 peter muller described the mullerian duct 
we do know that the mullerian duct is formed by 6 weeks by 10 weeks it fuses together by 22 weeks there is a dissolution of the septum and by 32 weeks it's almost ready to function completely many techniques of vaginoplasty have been described a colon vaginoplasty a ileal vaginoplasty a skin and amnion vaginoplasty but unfortunately none of these techniques result into formation of normal vagina so the question which has to be answered is it possible to develop a normal vagina so addressed to these questions we had certain presumptions and the, on these presumptions our research was based the, if you consider the genesis of mullerian duct it's a invagination of the lining mesothelium so in short the peritoneal lining and the mullerian duct lining uh, has got the same parentage now if there is a same parentage then definitely there can be an interchangeable possibility we also know that the peritoneum has got an ability to transform itself into a variety of tissues as far as the gynecologist is concerned and endometriosis and ovarian tumor we do know there are so many uh, changes which happen it also can result into a renal structure, a bone, and whatnot. So, with this presumption, we went ahead and we do know that there is a mesothelial to mesenchymal transition which has been documented, and there are various techniques and methodology by which it can be done. This is another technique by which a mesothelial transition can occur. So, 75 patients were analyzed of MRK syndrome, which were treated with this laparoscopic peritoneal vaginoplasty from 2003 to 2019. And there are three techniques which have been described of peritoneal vaginoplasty resulting into normal vagina. When we formed this all 75 patients and we did show that it is looks like a normal vagina, we subjected them for different confirmatory tests. The first was an anatomical confirmation test, which was done by cytology, vaginal biopsy, ultrasound, and a sexual score index, which these women were subjected to. Now, this is a vaginal cytology picture. We can see, and I'm sure this is almost indiscernible from that of a normal vagina. You can see the superficial cells, you can see the intermediate cell, and some of the parabysal cells are also shown here. The transformation which occurred into from this peritoneum to a normal vagina was done by serial vaginal biopsy. These patients were subjected at every week a vaginal biopsy and we wanted to find out how does the peritoneum change itself. Now this is a slide which shows a normal peritoneum, a single layer lining what you can see very clearly with the adventitial tissue which is loose and edematous. At the end of one week or seven days, you can see that the lining is still single layer, but there is an edema which presents into the sub uh, lining epithelium, uh, uh, endothelium. And you can see a lot of edematous tissue which has come up there. By two weeks, these changes are now there is a multicellular lining and there is a vascular endothelium which has started appearing. So this is the vasculogenesis, which is now started happening into this vagina. By the end of three weeks, this vasculogenesis now results into an angiogenesis. And you can see a very picture of small vessels, which are now developed there with multiple layer lining. And by end of four weeks, the neovagina is completely formed with multi-layer lining, with well-organized capillary, and blood flows. So by end of four weeks, there is a complete transformation of peritoneum into normal vagina. We did vaginoscopy on these patients and you can see these pictures. At the end of one week, you can still see a very reddish peritoneum covering into this neovagina. By end of two weeks, small white metaplastic spots starts appearing. By the end of three weeks or day 21, they start coalescing and forming a big patch. And by end of four weeks, the entire peritoneum is now completely covered with this metaplastic white lesions, which are multicellular 
nine. When we did biopsy at the end of three months and six, uh, five months, we even identified the squamous epithelium, which almost looks like a normal vagina. And by end of five weeks, uh, five months to six months, even the keratinization has started appearing. So in short, the lining epithelium has completely converted itself into the normal vaginal lining. This is a picture <clears throat> and you can appreciate a pre-op picture of MRKH with absent vagina. And now post-operative, you can see a beautiful pink vagina. And I'm sure it's very, very difficult to say that this is a created vagina. So the peritoneum has now completely converted itself into a normal pink vaginal wall. To your right, you can see the result of various vaginoplasties, the colon, the ileal, and the skin graft with amnion. And to your left, you can see the normal vagina, which is the resultant of our surgery. And it is definitely something which is more pleasing, normal, physiological, and anatomically correct with no telltale signs of surgery. Accidentally, one of the patients, we had to do a laparoscopy one year later than that. And you can see a small utricle with the ovary on one side and a normal, absolutely pelvic finding with no signs of surgery. And as it is done perennially and laparoscopically, these patients are extremely happy that no one can say that the vagina has been created and they do not have to confess themselves that they have got an absent vagina. Now we wanted to find out, yes, we have shown that the vagina is formed. This is how the changes occur. But who produced the changes? And what caused these changes? So we wanted to find out the causative progenitor cells in this patient. So similarly, these uh, vaginal biopsies were subjected for immunohistochemistry markers, namely SOX2 and OC4. And we identified the progenitor cells in this. Now, this is a normal peritoneal uh, stem cells which almost more than 20 cases we uh, did the biopsies, only in two patients we could identify these peritoneal stem cells. Then when subjected to this, we can identify this new vagina, which is showing the progenitor cells. The all green patches, what you see, are the scattered, the tubular, circular, and many different types of uh, progenitor cells, which are appearing in with different patterns. And this is the tubular and circular pattern, what you can see. Now at day seven, we first could identify the SOX2 uh, appearance, and this were a parallel distribution. Very unfortunately, the OC4 slide was lost in the process. By day 14, now you can see the SOX2 and OC4 markers, and SOX2 I have appeared into a tubular fashion while the uh, OC4 came in a circular type of a presentation. By three weeks or day 21, the OC4 started disappearing and SOX2 started going up. And finally, at the end of one month or day 28, we can see both OC4 and SOX2 are now extremely low in their concentration that having performed their function of transformation, now they are leaving this area and be going away from there. We also did the functional confirmation of this vagina. Well, it looks nice. It is normal vagina. We have studied how it happens, but does it function like a normal vagina? So we, when we subjected them for 3D ultrasound and Doppler angiogenesis, we could demonstrate a beautiful pattern which is resulted into a formation of a nice vaginal circulation around this vaginal epithelium. When subjected to a 4D ultrasound transperineally, uh, there was a big lacuna what we could identify. Now you can see two pictures, a sexually inactive normal vagina and a sexually inactive neo vagina, which is created by us. And you can see the stark difference that the normal vagina is a slit-like structure, while our neo-vagina is little more patulous as compared to this. 
which became very pronounced when we did in a sexually active patient. The vagina was extremely patulous and dilated. Obviously, the reason is that although we succeeded in developing a normal vaginal lining, we are not been able to produce the sublining or substratum which contains the elastic tissue. Everything else could regenerate, but the elastic tissue was difficult to regenerate. To get over this problem, we have a three-pronged approach. So I did develop a technique which is with a thick peritoneal graft with the idea that there will be a substantial elastic development. Very unfortunately, we did not get the results what we thought of. Second approach was developing the mesenchymal stem cells, which I will talk to you in a, a bit later. And the third simplest solution to all this was the pelvic exercises, which we got an excellent result. Now this is developing, we have started a, a entirely new different research where we have started developing autologous mesenchymal stem cells. And these were done from the patient's own blood, which was not very successful. Developing from the omental fat was a big, uh, I mean, success. However, to treat these patients, we require a very large colony and we are uh, developing that and also awaiting the permission to use them clinically. But the simple solution, what we found to this difficult answer was exercises. Now you can see three 4D ultrasound pictures where a normal patient with a patulous vagina, when she does a valsalva maneuver or contraction of the pelvic muscles, you can see the whole vagina now becoming narrow and slit-like uh, or semilunar in shape as a normal vagina. And therefore, now we have made this as a routine practice. All my girls who undergo vagina, uh, vaginoplasty are taught this pelvic floor exercises and they continue to do so. And the results are really very, very gratifying. This is an accidental 4D ultrasound, which we did on a patient who was operated just two weeks back. We wanted to find out what does the picture looks like. And we can see here a beautiful vaginal lining which is thrown into multiple folds, trying to cover the entire region and forming a multi-layer vagina. Having developed the normal vagina, having developed the causative, pro, I mean, identified the progenitor cell, we wanted to show the stainless markers and the translational genome in the cell itself. So we tried to extract the mRNA from the vaginal biopsies, and then we developed a cDNA from this, and then we subjected them to identify the stainless markers. And all three, OG4, NANOG, and SOX2 markers were identified how they come on the day of post-surgery, how they appear, and how then they after having the function, they disappear. It is shown in this graph. Now you can see some of these pictures where what exactly happens to these patients, how do they come up, they do their function, and then they disappear. All of us know that the Mullerian duct has got an external wall and a lining epithelium. And the Hoxha group of genes, which are namely the homeobox group of genes, which are responsible for the external growth. And the lining epithelium comes by winged or WNT uh, 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 genome. So we wanted to find out, do they have a role to play in our neovaginal creation? So 15 of these MRK patients who were operated and 12 controls were subjected to the genetic decoding by the Hoxha group 910A 1113 and WNT457A and 9. And we identified uh, these genomes, do they really play the role? And this is already published. And I'm very happy to say that this is the first of its kind publication of in the neovaginals. The expression of Hoxha group of genes were obviously found less than the control group. And the WNT group were found to be increased because these are the ones which produce 
the lining epithelium. Having identified the role, of, now you can see some of these uh, pictures. And here you can see the appearance of Hoxha and WNT group, how as compared to normal uh, control group, they appear. All these 15 patients showed a similar kind, uh, 14 patients showed a similar kind of a growth. But one patient had this gene expression, which was there in literally in thousands. Now, this was something which is more surprising to us because the rest of them were in hundreds and tens. Now, this particular girl somehow showed the development of normal vagina at an extremely rapid pace. By the end of three weeks and four weeks, her entire lining was formed with beautiful uh, keratinization also. We still really do not know uh, why this happened or how this happened. Uh, we're trying to solve this enigma. So having identified this GDO, we want to pursue our research in activating these translational genomes, and that may lead to developing the uterus, obviating the need of transplant. So these girls who have uh, no vagina, we can give them a normal vagina, and if possible, we can also develop their uteri and the cervix to give them a complete womanhood. Uh, before I conclude, I mean, I just want to uh, thank all my co-workers. I want to thank my patients who put faith in me and obviously today's organizers from Bangalore Society for giving me this opportunity. And if time permits, I will just share in two minutes some of a very, very difficult cases. Now, these patients who are associated with renal skeletal anomalies and cardiac anomalies, do also have a tremendous amount of vascular variation. Now, whenever I operate on these patients, I try and preserve all the vessels and do not do the cauterization as what has been normally uh, used in laparoscopic surgery. And you will be surprised to know that these vascular variations differ from patient to patient. Not only that, but they also differ from right to the left side of the patient. These are some of the very difficult cases uh, which you have to be prepared when you are operating on this MRK patient. These patients are not really uh, absolutely given to you as a virgin cases. They are one which are already operated or having associated with pediatric surgeons, I have been presented with a lot of young girls which have multiple problems. Just to highlight some of them, I will just show you a few of them. Now, this is a classical case of double ureter, a pelvic kidney, which you have to be extremely careful. Now, this to your left, you can see a patient of double ureter with single large pelvic kidney. And although in this picture, it appears like this, both the ureters were entwined with each other. And it's very, very, you have to be extremely careful in not to damage and produce any lethal problems. Now, this girl, post-married presented to me and it almost looks like a normal urethra and an excellent vagina but unfortunately this was a anus she was she underwent an anal pull through as a child and then she was having intercourse in this anus now only a paper thin area differentiated between the urethra and the uh, rectum or the anus uh, i do not have the time to show you but when the catheter was passed, you can see the catheter through the anal mucosa, that thing. And it was a really challenging case to operate on her, and we did succeed. This is a classical case of Kaufman syndrome. A nine-year girl with hematometra, hematocolpus presented, and she was already operated nine surgeries from birth. And it was a real challenging case. So you can see the multi-digital uh, anomaly which are associated with this and we could successfully operate on her and give her a normal vagina connected that hematometra and now she is menstruating three years have passed she is absolutely fine and doing great these are the pictures of hematometra hematocolpus and you can see she had an ileal vaginoplasty also as a child seven cases where we attempted a utricular development and implantation. And all seven patients 
have started resume menstruation. One of the patients in which the right utricle could develop, the ref utricle somehow did not respond. We even attempted an IVF pregnancy. Uh, very unfortunately, we did not succeed. Otherwise, it could have, it would have been uh, one of the first MRK patients having a normal pregnancy. This is a case of andro, I mean, uh, uh, very very important where there was an aromatase deficiency, and this girl presented looked like a Turner syndrome, and uh, she had also the anomalies, no vagina. You can see the distance, a clitoromegaly. And we operated on her, gave her a normal vagina, did a clitoral reduction, and also treated her aromatase deficiency. And now she's fine menstruating and married also. Uh, the last, my slide, there is something which is new, which I accidentally found. The anomalies of Mullerian ducts are really too many. But something which has not been described is a rotational anomaly of a Mullerian duct. Now you can see here, Two utricles with both the sides, the ovaries are on the right side. Now, this is a very classical different. I, I could not get any uh, references in the world literature. So, I just thought to highlight this uh, a rotational anomaly of the Mullerian duct. So, I think with this, I do not wish to overstep my time. And thank you very much, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to speak at your society, has always been very dear to me because I've been associated with Bangalore Society, I think for more than 40 years. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Should we uh, have the questions in the end or you would like to? We'll have the questions at the end, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, one, one more talk is a hope uh, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Matre will be here to answer questions if there are any. Correct. Okay. So it's, thank you very much, sir. It was a very beautiful uh, 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 lecture, very nicely presented. We would have been happier to see some more videos actually of, of uh, operations when you uh, are doing the real procedure. <laughs> sure, but uh, I think Thai. <laughs> Time is essence. Yes, yes, and, sir. Uh, I would not like to step on someone else's time. <laughs> uh, uh, any other I, time, we would be very happy to share you. Okay. And it, all these are published, so you can go yeah. through on the net. Right? Thank you very much, sir. It was very uh, really pleasure having uh, going through your lecture. Thank you. Thank May you. I request uh, Dr. Mahesh, who is the plastic surgeon consultant at uh, 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 Jain Hospital. He will be talking about the hymenal surgeries and uh, hymenoplasty. Um, he has uh, 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 done his uh, MCH uh, plastic surgery and then he's a fellow from the uh, USA and Singapore. And uh, <clears throat> he's uh, currently working in uh, uh, Jain Hospital and uh, also in the Sarvodaya Hospital. Uh, welcome, Mahesh. I won't take much of your time. You've been an extremely uh, popular and very popular sur uh, plastic surgeon as well. So please enlighten us with the, the uh, topic of hymen surgeries and hymenal surgeries. Thank you. Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Padmini Prasad uh, for this presentation. And I'm very happy to say that uh, Sir Ananteshwar Sir is here. Sir. So the topic given to me is uh, hymen surgeries. They are the surgeries routinely I'm doing. They're very rarely I do the hymenotomy. Already the Padmini Madam and uh, Dr. Ragini has told uh, so it is not uh, much important uh, in vaginismus and uh, uh, dyspareunia. And sometimes I do get a cases with profuse bleeding during uh, the first intercourses. They are the cases which I manage with the pressure or sometimes it's like getting the bigger vessels. But my area of uh, the interest is uh, hymen restoration uh, surgeries, which I'm going to talk now. The hymen is a thin, delicate membrane, partially covers the opening of the vagina in most girls. 
and it is uh, composed of uh, both elastin and collagen tissues and it is highly vascular in young people and uh, in old it is very thin and in adult it is uh, the thickness varies and also the aperture uh, the diameter also it varies most of the time it is going to turn during uh, the first intercourse the ideal site is posteriorly or posterior laterally with slight bleeding and it is a sign of uh, uh, virginity the hymen developed from the develop as a vestigial membranes of the vagina and urogenital sinus at their point of uh, fusion in the hymen is derived from a greek god uh, hymenius is a god of marriage and even hindus we call it as a kanya pare and sanskrit the uh, girl with intact hymen we call them we call it as akata yoni uh, sometimes kumari and kanya the functions of hymen is uncertain hypothetically they say infants it may prevent infection of vagina and may help in uh, the flow of menstrual blood in adults but hymen is of uh, social important and it is a symbol of virginity there are different uh, types of hymen which i come across sometime it will be absent and sometime they will be imperforated they will present as a cryptomenorrhagia and it can be annular semicircular septate or fenestrated the very common is uh, this type the elastic hymen okay so there are the cases the hymen will not be ruptured even in spite of repeated intercourses and sometime even it is present after deliveries there are the different types of uh, the hymen annular there the fimbriated and the septate and the crescentic and sometimes it is imperforated these are the different types of uh, uh, the hymen or uh, some of the cases which simulate hymen which i do come across this is typical uh, the virgin uh, the vagina where the hymen is intact and this is uh, the case with repeated intercourses here the hymen is also ruptured and also there is some secondary changes do you can see in uh, the labia minora and majora and other structures of the external genitalia and this is uh, some cases uh, say i do get a call from pediatrics the saying uh, there is a hymen but uh, there are the cases i get confused if i examine it look it is a case of uh, the labial adhesions which can be separated with a digital examination and most of the time uh, you do get confused with uh, vaginal atresia i think parietal examination some of the ultrasound scanning may help in rule out uh, from the cryptomenorrhea or uh, intact hymen or imperforated hymen the hymen <clears throat> in many girls and teens it, it, it is uh, going to tear otherwise they get uh, they get dilated with their finger and that is a commonest cause of uh, the accidental rupture and most of the time it go into rupture during first intercourses sometime the sports like uh, bicycling and horse riding gymnastics and insertion of tampons and sometime even masturbating the hymen gets ruptured and uh, there the girls may not even know this has occurred since there may be a little or no blood or pain involved when this happens by plastic surgery hymen can be restored back i do get uh, cases either from uh, the direct referral from a gynecologist who are uh, mainly uh, specialized in uh, uh, the sexual uh, the diseases and i do get uh, cases direct call from the hospitals either it could be corporate or some of the institutions and i do get a uh, cases referred by some of the private practitioners and sometimes these patients these people they come with a group of sex workers or health workers and sometimes they came alone to my consultation room or sometimes they come with the parents even I had a case with 20 year girl she is a sister of a doctor the unknown is the pregnancy till at the eight month later she delivered a baby later she came to me for complete body correction that is i did a abdominoplasty breast correction dinoplasty later the same girl got married to a different man 
and this is a very common problem we and gynec uh, we face the bread will be forced or backed uh, to us uh, to say elastic amen when the bleeding does not happen uh, during the the first night we do amenoplasty is either because of cultural reason to save the bride or to take and the vagina for better sex before uh, uh, dealing with amenoplasty this are the history i take whether the sexual intercourse has happened once or it is because of rape or he, he, she has undergone repeated uh, intercourse and the history of menstruation is uh, very important and uh, very important is history of a sexual transmitted disease an examination always uh, try to see the infection any inflammation any injury or any growth in the vagina and these are uh, some of the simulation some of these the girls they try to attempt they try to prove themselves they are virgin they will try to uh, put some time dye inside their vagina sometimes they get in, the self inflicted injury to their vagina or even they may insert gelatin capsules filled with uh, the blood like substances and even there are history where they have inserted a leech that has formed the clot inside the vagina there are some of the attempt they try to prove themselves they are virgin during the first intercourse the anatomical changes which happens uh, after intercourse that has to be examined properly like uh, the examination of uh, hymen residue the vaginal mucosa the length of the vagina the muscle tone is very important and surrounding area should be addressed and general physical examination like uh, the diabetes uh, the anemia and thyroid disorders to be ruled out the most of the time uh, uh, the following intercourse the vaginal length circumference also increases along with the damage of the hymen and even uh, we can see changes in the mucosa of the vagina including the texture color and the contour and the muscles vasc uh, the laxity of the vasc uh, vaginal musculatures is very common and the gaping also is going to increase and after intercourse the repeated intercourse vagina has a unesthetical appearance and sometimes we we can have a prolapse this type of cases so there are the different techniques of hymenoplasties which were uh, described one is suturing the uh, remnants together if the hymen is not too damaged or by simple closure the two edges are available or the primary suturing can be done by undermining laterally if the hymen remnants are uh, insufficient and sometimes temporary measures like encerclage the thread and the wedding night uh, can be done and this is uh, there are the definitive uh, surgeries like uh, the different flap techniques which i am going to de describe the later part of this presentation and alloplastic implants and insertion of gelatin i don't have experience about this and nowadays uh, in the google you can uh, find all this uh, laser and radio frequency aminoplasties there are the usual techniques surgical techniques i follow one is uh, the hymen undermining and the second technique uh, i do the two vaginal mucosal uh, technique and the third is uh, the vestibular intraoral uh, tightening technique here the posterior vertical section of uh, vestibular and introitus is done and followed by a tightening and reconstruction and uh, this method is uh, luminal the reduction techniques where the hymen the residue the edge was trimmed with the scissor and it is closed primarily but these techniques most of the time it is not going to give the good and definitive uh, results it is going to correct only the partial Uh, rejuvenation of the vagina but uh, see now i started uh, using this technique i use superior and inferiorly based uh, triple flap with uh, along with the muscle tightening i got this idea from this uh, spinter pharyngoplasty it was done for uh, uh, valley pharyngeal incompetence there this is a condition where there is a narrow uh, uh, junction between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx where the speech will be affected following cleft palate surgery this was first described by the articulate later modified by the many people what we do here is circumferentially tightening the whole length of the vagina 
along with the muscle and hymen reconstruction so that the whole abnormal the post sexual or post coital changes of the uh, vagina which is going to happen that can be corrected this is a, a articokia technique which see this is there in our plastic surgery textbook in cleft lip and palate I think uh, Ananteshwar sir uh, knows better about this technique. See what he does is he take a two rectangular uh, flap laterally. They are the two rectangular flap. This is the central flap, but he will not you are going to use the central flap. But I have modified uh, this technique a little uh, more advanced way. So this is a flap which is close to uh, the midline. This flap it was not touched. The idea is to narrow the pharynx, pharyngeal opening. So all my cases operate under uh, GR spinal, the lithotomy position, the retracted uh, stitches are placed for the uh, labia majora and minora. I use infiltration, vaginal wash I use. So I use uh, two flaps laterally and one central flap in opposite direction. So after elevating the flap, I'm going to tighten the muscle. And the flap is going to close uh, horizontally to reconstruct the hymen using a vehicle. This is a case. This is repeated intercourse. There are the two lateral flaps, rectangular flap. This is a central flap. So I'm going to use these flaps with the posterior and this is anterior. So this is going to give a hymen. At the same time, I'm going to tighten the underlying muscle. This is a good aesthetically appearing vagina. And this is a hymen. Only I can insert my little finger. This is a, the diagram, schematic diagram. Uh, which is showing the technique. The blue line is showing uh, the two rectangle uh, flap, which is superiorly based. And this is the green is the central flap. It is uh, uh, the posteriorly based. These two flaps I'm going to elevate anteriorly. This is posteriorly. And the central part is a muzzle. I'm going to tighten it circumferentially with a multiple vehicle stitch. Later, the superior flap, I'm going to place it posteriorly and the inferior plast, flap, I'm going to place it anteriorly. So this is going to give a good hymen structure. This is a hymen. At the same time, vaginal, the canal is going to narrow and also length is also is going to shorten. The post-op, I do simple dressing, vaginal wash sometime and it's worth this was. And all the all my patients, I give instruction, no sex for uh, six to eight weeks. There are the complications very rarely anticipated like bleeding, rupture, dysense, infection, injury to the surrounding structures and vaginismus and uh, sometimes rupture. You can see the rupture, the other patient, they need a redo, uh, revagination surgery, sometimes prolapse and scarring and fibrosis also seen. This is uh, the girl, 20 year, where the pregnancy was uh, unnoticed. She delivered a baby. So I need to address her abdomen also. I did abdominoplasty. Her breast, I did a liposuction. At the same girl, I did uh, the vaginoplasty along with the hymenoplasty. So the same girl. So I did the same three flap technique. One, two. There the lateral technique, central technique. The muzzle was tightened at the center, this is a closure, the good diamond has formed. This girl, I did a partial perineography also because the perineum is also stretched. So I repaired the perineo, perineal muscles also. This is uh, before closure, I always I try to see the uh, uh, diameter of the hymen by inserting my finger and also I can assess the tone also, this technique. This is one more girl. She wanted diaminoplasty along with the labia minora uh, reduction. So this is uh, already explained. Two lateral flap, central flap. This is a central flap. These two lateral flap, it is going to uh, form a posterior layer of the hymen. The central flap it is going to form the anterior outer layer of the hymen. So inside muscle, I'm going to tighten it. So always I do this test that is a finger insertion test to know the diameter of the hymen and also the tone and thickness of the hymen. And the labia minora was reduced with a simple excision and primary closure. This is the end result after two months. 
So before her, uh, the marriage, she came to me. So this is the labia minor has done well. This is a good diamond. So I can insert my little finger inside and the patient is very happy. There are some of the techniques explained. That is a vestibular intratel technique. I tried all this, but uh, the results are very poor because uh, we are not addressing the circumference length and uh, the underlying the stretched muscle. So better not to use these techniques. So this is a technique. You can see the hymen is not formed well. This is a luminal reduction technique. Even this will not work uh, the much, just trimming and suturing because uh, the, we are not addressing the underlying muscle and uh, the other vaginal structures. So always uh, I face uh, the ethical and legal issues. So I think it is debatable. Before operating, I always think, I, am I cheating a groom? Am I cheating a man? That question always it come to my mind. But uh, considering uh, some of this uh, ethical, uh, uh, the pillars like autonomy of the patient, and we are providing uh, uh, the more benefit to the patient rather than uh, do no harm. And with justice, maintaining some dignity and honesty, I think uh, we are uh, justifiable to do these surgeries. The morality is affects. I think considering it is our kartavya, dharma, and uh, dharma left to God. So this is very interesting. I explored uh, some of this, uh, our ancient, uh, the books, which also mentioned about uh, rejuvenation of vagina and uh, virginity, returning the virginity back. All these were, uh, uh, techniques were uh, described long back. They are the sum of uh, um, the inscription. Always I had a question, did ancient Indian described all this restoration virginity many centuries before a pramic or western? Not only this, there are many other surgeries too. So Shushuta also described these techniques in Yoni, Vyapati, Pati Seda, Charaka, Samhita also describe about this. And uh, the Vagbata has done an intensive work in his uh, Ashtanga Rudaya Samhita. So he has created, uh, he has used many techniques to simulate the virginities. All these, uh, the techniques were translated maybe from past 2000 years and all this information has migrated uh, uh, to Arab and Persia and to the Eastern countries. So always I thank our uh, Indian uh, people. Thank you. Aita. Yes, sir. Uh, there's Can no questions in the chat yeah. box, Sananteshwar, sir. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Mahesh, it was a very nice uh, presentation. I think it reminds me of uh, when you talked about the morality and about the self-consciousness in these surgeries. It is very well to remember Bhartrahari's uh, saying, say that, you know, Satyam Bhruyat, Priyam Bhruyat, Satyam Nam Apriyam. That means you should tell the truth, you should tell the pleasant thing, but never tell an unpleasant truth. So ultimately, that is what it derives our profession. <laughs> so in some times, you are helping one person um, at the cost of cheating. That's what you feel that way. But I, I guess I think once the whole effect is in the right uh, perspective, I think it should be fine. Um, I really enjoyed all the uh, 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 lectures. Padmini, with your uh, uh, first um, uh, talk about the vaginismus, then followed by Ragini for the management, uh, especially Botox. I had one question for Botox, uh, when Dr. Ragini. Does she check with the bupivacaine before she gives a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Botox? That was my question. And I don't know if she's there, she can answer. And then, I am is there. She is unmute. Yeah. Okay, okay. Right. Yes. So, uh, no, I have never given the bupacane somehow okay. to any patient. Yes, lidocaine gel, yes, I give. But okay. then I go for the directly, if patient was not responsive to anything, then I directly okay. go to the Botox therapy. All right. Second question, do you do any ultrasound guided uh, injection or you just uh, anatomical? Directly, sir. Anatomical? Directly, sir. Thank you. <laughs> The um, uh, next was, of course, uh, Professor Matres. It was an excellent rendition of the uh, lecture. And finally, uh, Dr. Mahesh talked about hymenoplasty. 
the whole session was excellent but i think um, we missed out dr shobha she was supposed yes. to have the first yes. <laughs> she is unable to come sir she is held up <laughs> okay. she has okay. uh, given an apology that right, she is right. unable to come Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Doctor Padmini. Thank you, for sir. You are my uh, colleague, uh, my is, senior. Uh, uh, <laughs> Abhi, excellent to listen, everyone. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Nice. Uh, thank okay. You. Thank you all. We will end this session. That was a very wonderful session. Uh, thank you, Jyoti. Jyoti, uh, one minute. Doctor Jyoti, just one or two. Doctor Mahesh was uh, telling about the reverence of the Vajena. Correct. Some of the customs we still uh, um, follow today. See, even the triangle which is there, inverted triangle, that shows the fertility and the reverence given to the vagina or the vulva. So that is how that is, the rangoli and everything we put you know, all types of rangoli and especially that Sri Chakra where there are uh, nine uh, inverted triangles, five downward pointing, uh, four upward pointing and all intertwining. So that is about the male, female, uh, the sexual power, uh, power union, fertility. How in every even uh, foreigners observe that uh, horseshoe, putting the iron horseshoe on the doors and the threshold Correct. to give uh, food. That even uh, many people, many of us even today they also follow that. So all these traditions have given that reverence or uh, uh, the sanctity to the all these uh, the genital organs or the organs of uh, fertility. So that's all uh, I thought I will uh, add to what Dr. Mahesh also has said. Thank you very Thank you, much. Ma'am, you have nicely justified the topic, webinar topic. <laughs> so we yes. move on to the end of this session. And thank, thank you all. Uh, Dr. Sunita uh, will be there to give the vote of thanks. Please, Sunita, take thank over you. and... Good afternoon, one and all. On uh, behalf of BSOG, I would like to propose the vote of thanks. I would like to thank our president, uh, Dr. Padmini Madam, for giving me this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks. So I would like to thank the event coordinators, Jyoti Madam and Dr. Manjana for uh, uh, coordinating the event gracefully. I would like to thank Dr. Mahesh Koregal for uh, proposing the, uh, for welcoming the gathering. I would also like to thank the chairpersons, Dr. Padmaja Madam, Dr. Sunanda Kul. Karni, Madam, Dr. Sheila Mani, Madam, and Dr. Ananteshwar, sir, and Dr. Narayan Swami, sir, for um, uh, accepting to cha chair the three wonderful sessions of the past, present, and future sessions of the Vagina, the uh, Revere, the sac Sacred Passage. I would like to thank uh, the speakers, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Uma, Madam, Dr. Venkatramana, Dr. Bafna, sir, Dr. Shobha Gudi, Madam, Dr. Sheila Mane, Madam, Dr. Uh, Dr. Padmini Prasad, Madam, Dr. Ragini, Dr. Praveen Matre, and Dr. Mahesh. And I would also like to thank our BSOG uh, members for attending the uh, session. I would like to thank Suchitra and Shukumar uh, from the BSOG office for helping to coordinate to conduct the session. I would also like to thank the Zydus for TISA for uh, giving us this uh, platform to conduct the uh, webinar. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Abbott, Abbott people. Abbott, yeah. Yes. Thank you all. It was really very nice, enlightening sessions and a lot of information, practical uh, take-home messages. I should thank all speakers for their uh, really, with all the personal experience, which all of them gave the input, insight into that. So thank you all. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.